Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and buttonbrostudios.com. I'm in the house with Corey Barton, the other half of the Barton Bros duo, and none other than Professor Murph, the creator, illustrator of War Party, which you can check out via the link in the description below. He's got an Indiegogo campaign up for it right now, and he's offering a lot of... Uh, a lot of interesting perks. Actually, that is one thing specifically about you, Murph, is that you, you're very inventive when it comes up to the little add-ons that you offer to your backers um, and how you upsell them, you might say, with figures and additional books and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean, I just... It's weird because... Um... A lot of people have the mythology or mythology. What I'm thinking, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, the uh, the ideology that you're supposed to just pre-plan everything you're going to offer, like at the very beginning, and that's yeah. not how it happened at all. I mm -hmm. I was just going to offer some books. Uh, there was no issue zero. There was no handbook. There was no action figure. There was no slipcase. Mm -hmm. None of that stuff. Um, it, it was just comics and. Uh, for some reason, just the way that the campaign started to develop, I started to think of things I would want if I were back yeah. in this. You know what I mean? That's awesome. And Did, when you were adding them in there, were you at all apprehensive about whether or not you would be able to actually fulfill all, all of the things that you had included? Because, I mean, you included a lot of stuff. I mean, you're painting up hand-painting figures and whatnot. I mean, that that's all going to take up a lot of time, and it probably is taking up a lot of time for you, which is uh, why you're likely so productive. Uh, you know, why you, you don't procrastinate. Well, I'm sure you procrastinate like most of us do from time to time, but why you, you, know, you quickly stomp that out and just get to it? Yeah, it's, um, it's it, there's two things with crowdfunding. You're either going to spend more money or you're going to spend more time, mm -hmm. right? So I tried to find a balance between the two. Um, for example, doing the handbook, it only took me a month to knock it out, less than a month, actually three weeks, because it was basically, it was basically just reusing a lot of artwork, drawing some character poses, and you, the rest is writing. So I was like, this is not going to take a ton of time. It's not going to cost that much money to make another book, because um, mm -hmm. printing is really not that bad. And I'm not paying a colorist or an artist, so you know, there's that. The mm -hmm. dolls, same thing. A lot of time to paint it and a lot of money. They're not cheap, but I also charged enough that I could make mm -hmm. a profit. And then zero is not going to cost anything because it's black and white, so I'm not even paying a colorist for that, but that's going to take a lot of time. So you kind of have to weigh how much time do I want to give, how much more, how much money do I want to spend. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, I think they offer T-shirts and hats and all this stuff, and they're not thinking about the fact that they're upping their costs every time they do that. So you're oh, yeah. eating into your profit the more you do that. So the cheapest thing to offer people is more content. Mm -hmm. If you can give them more content and you're doing the work, that's the cheapest thing to offer. And truthfully, it's what people want the most. Like they just want to read more, you know? Yeah. Yeah, big time, man. And as you said, there's always going to be that uh, offset with the amount of time that it's going to take to do that extra stuff. So uh, you've got to balance it out. Ultimately, I, you're offering so much, though, that uh, that even if people were were waiting uh, a year or two for War Party, it, it'd be kind of worth it. Because how many books have you got on offer in this campaign? There, there's six issues, but yeah, what, what but what I'm able to do, and it's going to cost me more money, is um, offer them in separate shipments. So instead mm -hmm. of shipping all six together, like I had originally planned mm -hmm. when I, when I realized that I was going to be behind in delivery because of the amount of books, I just said, you know what, I'm going to split this up. I'm going to do one through three, ship those, ship them with the handbook and then ship uh, four through six and zero after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. I couldn't do that with a graphic novel, obviously, you know, cause yeah. it's all one volume, but because it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it's uh, serialized, so to speak. You know, they're, they're floppies. Um, I'm able to break them up. Now, it's going to cost me more money, but I, I tell first-time campaigners this especially. Do not expect to make a profit on your first campaign. Forget that. 
Forget that idea. You might, but the truth is you need to be building an IP. You need to be building a brand and, and, and fulfilling and building an audience. Then you'll make money eventually. Like I, you know, I think that's the way to go about it. I think a lot of people jump in. They think they're just going to make you know ten thousand dollars profit right out of the gate, hoping that that's going to happen, and then they get disappointed when it doesn't. You know. Yeah, that's that's very very true. And I mean, the smart thing to do is to reinvest into your brand, into your comic book studio, your comic books, whatever it is you're intending to do, wherever it is you're intending to take this. Uh, you're going to need money to sustain Wait, yourself. So and should I so, build my own studio in my backyard? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's weird because I've already, because of the success, I mean, I, I, my goal is 10,000. I'm pushing 36 right now. So mm -hmm. that to me is what I call a mandate. In other words, you know how politicians say, I have a mandate, you know, when they get elected on a really high margin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, if, yeah. if you if you run a campaign and it exceeds your your expectations by 300 percent or more, um, that's a mandate. So what that means is I, I have there's enough potential in War Party, I think, to invest my future in it. In other words, cool. this is an IP I need to stay with, you know what I mean, and, and build upon. And uh, I'm excited because the handbook, when I did the handbook, I was basically making a promise. The back of the handbook is basically a, a, a photo, or photo album, sticker album. Mm -hmm. And um, in the sticker album, it's a bunch of blank pages with coded spaces for stickers. There's nothing there. So that's, the second half of the book is just blank pages with, with like a background design. And um, as I do future books, I've already got the books planned out in the timeline uh, for the next four books, four or five books. Nice. So I'm kind of committing myself to a, uh, and I can show it to you real quick. I'm committing myself Ooh. to a future with this. Um, let me see, where is it? Sports. Yeah. Okay. So let me pull up the timeline here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This was actually my son's idea. He was 12. Hey, if you want a successful grant, <laughs> campaign listen to 12 year old boys <laughs> because oh yeah they know what they're talking about. yeah we're 12 year old boys apparently because they mm -hmm. like the same stuff um oh hell yeah i like what i liked at 12 uh now, now. yeah now. yeah like like yeah. savage sort of conan <laughs> totally <laughs> um unfortunately yeah there we go okay so this not. it's not finished but the the the, the text is missing. This is just the, the image, but um, there's there's text here. But what it does is it breaks down the timeline. So the series right now that I'm working on is this right here. It's Colonial America. Zero goes back to the 1500s, okay? And then these are the future books, which I don't put the full titles, but you see the logo with letters missing. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is when those books come out, they'll get a sticker a sticker book in the back of the book that comes with the book and they pull the stickers out and then it's got the code right here and you stick the sticker over the logo and the, the back of the book works the same way. So, cool. yeah. So what it does is cause like in the front of the book you have, uh, let's see, you have the character, hang on. Yeah, the character pages. It's kind of like um, mm. the Marvel Universe, where the characters the characters standing here. You have all the text. It, it, it's, this is an unfinished page, but characters are there. There's all this text. You know what? Actually, I don't know why I'm That's doing so this. Fun. Hold on. <laughs> all right, let's say hello to the chat for a moment. We got Corey in the chat for some reason. He's also in the panel. Uh, oh, yeah. so two places at once. It's He's it's, our, it's already printed, and I'm sitting here showing you files. <laughs> Um, there you go. That's that's the page. So so what happens is you know the front of the book is kind of like Marvel Universe where you have your characters, you that's know, cool. nice. and a scene and their first appearance and their bios and everything. Um, then in the back, depending on the book you get, this sticker, the character will be here, the bio will be here on clear sticker and then a scene from whatever will be there. So it'll be, so you're looking at, you know, one, two, three, four, five stickers per page, depending on 
what series it or what book it was. So it, this is an expandable volume that by the time the full collection is done, it'll have all the information in here. That's so yeah. cool, man. Hmm. Really, yeah, really great idea. better use for stickers because I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, they actually have a purpose. Kids, but, <laughs> right. You know. right, yeah, yeah. They serve, they serve a purpose. And um, I even have here, I don't want to give spoilers, but oh. I have a map of everything that happens with the war party during the series, like all the major events. Um, there's even a little historical background because um, this being a historical subject matter, you kind of have to know, if you don't know anything about the French and Indian War, this page gets you up to speed right away. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you know what's going on, you know who's fighting and why, and then I tell you how my characters fit in that world. And then, yeah. uh, then it goes into the transformation ritual step by step, how they transform, how it works what they have to do, the steps they have to take when they put the pelt on and, and drink. They actually have to drink some of her blood because she's uh, so cool. she's divine, you know, so she has healing powers. And then you see where, you know, that's a human size. This is how big they get oh, when no. they, wow. uh, they transform. And then it answers little sort of like questions like, what is speed and agility? What's their armor? What's their size and strength? How do they heal? What type of uh, traits do they get? A size chart. You know, so it's it's mm. it's fun. You know, it's going to be a it's a good companion, and I was able to throw this in for ten dollars, no shipping, because I just throw it right in with your order. You know, that's amazing. It, it's it's great that you were just able to to throw that together. How long how long did it take? Did you put it together yourself? Yeah, I well, see, I I have a history with pre press, so I know how to do all the layout and pre press work myself. Mm -hmm. So I did all this myself. I didn't hire a graphic yeah. designer or anything. But I was able to take existing art that I had already done in the series and just throw it in there. The only things I had to create new were the maps, do the typing, and then uh, for the character pages, you know, like the actual character bios, I had to draw standing poses. But even these are taken out of the book. So really, other than the standing poses, the maps and the typing, mm. there's really nothing. And, you know, laying out the book, that's what took three weeks. But... Um, I and mean, this is for like the you know the diehards, the people that really want to get into this world and not just read issues one through six, but want to like be in for the long haul and you know. Mm. Yeah, totally, man. I think that's fantastic. Right, and we I, we're gonna have to do something like this for the next issue, Cozy. You should, good. you should, especially if you're building a world, you know. We can yeah. do that, Corey, but we're gonna have to get as fast as Murph is. <laughs> that's that's the catch. That's true. So. Uh, I'm just going to quickly say hello to the chat here. We got Brian in the house. Hey man, how you doing? Uh, Chimera, I saw your uh, question before. Yeah, we're but we're streaming on both the Barton Bros channel and the How to Draw Comics channel. We're trying to build both those channels up. How to Draw Comics. We're able to stream onto that today in the group because, well, Murph is doing exactly that. He's illustrating comic books. So, uh, what 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 could yeah. be more appropriate? Uh, we've got LC in the house. How to get a comic done? Yeah. I if and need this, I am a master at not getting a comic done. Look, it takes a lot of work. A lot of energy and time goes into it. Commitment. And uh, it requires major commitment. The replicator is here. Uh, the good mod. Also known as the good mod. Really? Uh, uh, Joss. Joss. How do I pronounce that, Corey? Joss, Joss, how you doing anyway, man? It's it's good to to have you tuning in with us. Uh, we've got Eric. He's looking for Jabba. Where is Jabba? He's not here. I haven't seen Jabba in a very hey, long time, actually. Tell us his last name, man. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Vigula, Vigula. Chad, if I don't say hi to you, I'm saying hi in my in my heart. Okay. Yeah. I'm just exactly. I'm drawing, so if I seem a little antisocial, it's that's not because I don't love you. Mm, he's in the mode. This is what a man looks I mean, like when he's hard at work. Okay, pay yeah. attention, people. He's not messing around. He's not joking about. He's getting to it. Uh, we've got Chris Crenham, uh, a Clayton Barton mouse. Matt Perk would be the best perk ever. Yeah, yeah I mean, dude. Well, I seen. <laughs> Maybe it was like, was it Raging Golden Eagle or some other one? Mm. <laughs> they do like the uh, boob mouses, and I'm like, damn. Hell I yeah. thought about it. I don't think my wife would like it. Boob mouses. 
You haven't it, seen it does. Really? It, what matters is if you it's like, like the it cushion or... mouse pad thing. Check this out. This is uh, this is actually my mouse pad. It's it is a piece of artwork I did of uh, guts from Berserk, uh, so which you got cool. incorrect, man. Yeah, hey. I did get it incorrect. Oh, nice. It's pretty cool. Uh, I th His actually, I don't think I did that. I think my my partner got that for me, maybe. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I would take an opportunity to talk about storytelling because um, <clears throat> that's yeah. the most important thing. Drawing is not the most important thing. Storytelling is the most important thing. Uh, people out there that want to do comics, um, people will forgive mediocre drawing if the storytelling is strong. But if you uh, have great, yeah, if you have great drawing but you can't tell what the heck's going on, it, it yeah. doesn't matter. So what um what I'm doing here is I wanted to do a really cool double page spread and I wanted a lot of things to happen. But what that meant was I had to reverse engineer the page before it <laughs> because mm -hmm. what hap what's happening here is um, the cannons firing as he rips the wall and the cannon collapses. So you have two mm -hmm. things happening simultaneously. He's ripped the wall. The cannon has already fired and fallen and then the shot is hit and exploded. So I had to do something the previous page to sort of set that up. So what I'm doing is um, the guy shells the, shouts the command to fire. You see the wolf. They're shooting at him. Uh, they see the wolf through the window uh, moving toward or through the you know, little hole moving toward. He mm -hmm. lights the fuse, the wick. Now, the way these cannons worked is you had a, you had a, a big rope tied around a pole, and it was ignited. It was lit. And then you had a wick stuck into the, the barrel of the cannon, and they would light it, and it would take a about a second or more for that to burn down and ignite the powder. So that mm -hmm. second is when he's grabbing the down shot of him grabbing the wall. So then when we turn the page, pow, the cannon goes off, he rips the wall. And it's it, that's another thing. You want to surprise people on even pages, not odd pages. Because odd pages, when you flip through a comic book, this is the odd page. So when they turn the page, you've given it away. So if you ever want a surprise, save it for an even page. So then they turn the page, whoa, boom, there it is. You know, So that's kind of what I did here. Um, and my colorist is awesome. I, I hear people grumbling about not being able to find um, find good colorists. And yeah. uh, just to show you what, what an awesome colorist can do, uh, there's, of course, you know, the black and white, and there's the color. I mean, just, he is an amazing colorist. Yeah, I have I love to say. he really is. Yeah, I, uh, I'm very happy. I've worked with him for years. He did Claiborne with me. But things like this, which I actually am a fan of, putting characters in the foreground in a different sort of color temperature, uh, he does this a lot, and I love it. It's not necessarily correct in terms of, you know, if this was the real world, would they be that purple or blue? Probably not. But when you look at it in the context of a page, it just it pops it looks hmm. so cool. He does it so well, and you know they are. It is nighttime there in the dark, and he does have some light reflecting. Yeah, mm -hmm. ambient bounce but, light. That looks cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and he's cheating a little, but I love it. I mean, the clarity is everything, and that's the thing. Like, if this mm. were black and white in a comic, I would have had to gone in here with gray tones, half tones, and I would have to half tone yeah. this because you can't even as much as I put the darks in there, you can't see really what's going on unless you really look at it closely. But then mm -hmm. once you put the color in there, it just separates everything. I mean, you can see everything clearly with everything that's going on. And, uh, yeah, just very happy with him. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very true, man. And I, uh, I envy the fact that you can let go and just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to leave the line art as this. I'm going to call this done for me. And then I'm going to let the colorist take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that, that's trust of your colorist. <laughs> it is. It is. Are you saying you, you don't have trust? You're not trusting your colorist, Clayton? Is that what you're telling me? I trust me? Corey. I do trust Corey. Uh, but he, it, Clayton makes my job easier. I, I want the uh, I want the line art to be as complete as possible, and the colors right. to be complete as possible. It's a weird OCD thing, I think. Uh, Knowing when I, to stop. Yeah. Knowing when to stop. It's, yeah. It's yeah. hard. And. and it's almost like you've gained the ability to stop before it's taken 
to 100 percent you're definitely applying the uh you know the 80 20 rule or whatever it is and and i'm trying to get to that point where i let go a little bit and i'm content with it not being 120 percent done right go all that man that's what i say well, yeah, one, I'll, I'll quote a really awesome artist, but uh, or not quote him, but I'll I'll use one him as an example is Rob Willis. Um, I okay. actually prefer Rob Willis's art in black and white. Oh yeah, it's because he's a good colorist. But even when you do, I see his black and white stuff, and I actually like it better. And I think it's because he's so good at rendering, and he's so good at value and making things look separated that when you when it gets colored. Yeah. You lose the beauty. You can't see his line art anymore. Like you can't see his work like you can in black and white. So I prefer some artists seem to shine more in black and white. I think he's one of them, mm. honestly. But yeah, yeah I a hundred percent agree with you. It's um, it's really tough. I think very few colorists are able to uh, do justice to work like that. In all honesty, I don't know why because. Like Corey, for example, and I understand what he means when he says this, uh, he'll always reference the fact that uh, with my highly detailed and rendered work, and, and same situation with his, it's very detailed, very highly rendered, uh, it can be somewhat easier, in fact, to figure out you know where the highlights need to go, where the shadows hmm. need to right. uh, appear, well, and, and how the light needs to fall across those forms. Can I say something on that, man? Yeah. Okay, I'll say it's easier, but the fact is, like, you shouldn't take that, uh, like, for granted and think, like, well, I'm just not going to do, like, like, a simple job on the colors because the inks are pretty mostly doing the work. Yeah, I mean, it's easier as in like, you've got a bit more guidance there almost, but then, in a sense, if yeah. you're dealing with a line art that has, you know, less rendering, less shadows, less detail and, and intricacy then uh, ultimately maybe as the colorist, you've got a bit more freedom to do what it is you want to do with it to incorporate a mm. little bit more of your vision. And that's definitely true in some in, in m most circumstances. Some colorists prefer that. Yeah, so, I, I, try yeah. To, um, I try to make it as clear as possible in black and white. Like I feel like if, like for example, this page, you know, I feel like if you can make everything as clear as possible – in black yeah. and white, then when it gets to the color phase, it's going to be that much clearer. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of times that means dropping out the backgrounds, you know, like, like yeah. there's no background here. There's no background here. There's no background here because action, mm -hmm. action is the focus of this page. It's not about the setting. Whereas, yeah. you know, a shot may be like this down here. I, I went all out on the background down here because yeah. I wanted to show relation of the characters mm -hmm. to the canon and everything you know and then, of course here back to action so i dropped the background out you know uh, so it just okay. depends background in background in right so how did you, your colorist approach a background like that um with uh, like an action shot and still make it interesting without any defined line work there uh in, well in the well i mean i guess this would be a good example or, or let me see if i have another mm. page like see here, yeah. See, I put I put more detail into here's one right here. Like oh, sometimes so cool. sometimes I black out the the background on some shots because I wanted to you know to focus on the fire right here. What matters is what's happening. This thing's landed here and there's a bunch of gunpowder. So we know we all know it's going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. You know this is this is your Bugs Bunny moment, right? You know <laughs> when it says Acme. Or powder, <laughs> something, yeah. something's gonna happen, you know. So, um, but then, like, if you you go back to this shot, you know, I put more detail in the foreground, less detail in the in the fort in the background. And you see how he blued it out? How mm. here it's 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 brown. It's the color. It's local color with fire. The further mm. away you get, the more grayed out and blued out it gets, and it creates depth. If he had colored this the same color as this. It wouldn't have nearly as much depth. Oh, and, so uh, true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And God, the way sure. I like, I look at his work sometimes, and I he, he colored GI Joe for years, which makes sense because I've always been a GI Joe fan. But like the way he lit this cannon, 
the way he put the blues right here and the, re the, the light reflection. So, I mean, that's just beautiful. Like, I just look at yeah. that and think, man, you know, it's great when you can work with someone and you admire what they're doing. Oh yeah. To, to your work. You know? Yeah, man. And I know that feeling you can just, you just want to look at it for hours because uh, you're so happy with the job that they've done. I feel the same way about Julius on uh, the Borok comic, actually, that our spinoff of Kozor we've got in the works. And um, it's just like when he hands a page in, I am in awe, you know. So, yeah, finding good people that uh, take your vision far and beyond where you imagined it could be, that's when you know you, you've found a winning team, a, a, a power team, essentially. Yeah. Well, I mean, like like this scene, I, I did the, the whole page black, blacked it out, because I really wanted this to just pop. And just what he did, I said, I want this, like, she's finding out what his spirit animal is. He's pulling out the wolf, see? Mm -hmm. um, there's all these Native American symbols blended into, uh, and then she, you know, the wolf flies overhead, and she tells him, you know, that's what it is. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's just... He's incredible. He'll do things like, well, like this, for example, where he changes the color. He didn't keep it blue, blue. He changed it to like a, you know, warm tone, but it makes it contrast better against these panels than if he had just said, well, the sky's blue. It's nighttime. So I'm going to do the same blue here that I did mm -hmm. here. You see, he, he, he avoids that monotony. Um, oh, these one thing. Yeah, this was, this was a nightmare to flat. I actually went in and flatted the water for him because it was so intricate, all the different splashes yeah. of water, that there was no way he would know where the water was, <laughs> like where I was intending the water to be and where I was intending like the rock to show through or her body to show through. Mm -hmm. um, but here she's transforming uh, she's from, from the deer. <laughs> Thanks. She's yeah. this is my girl. This is Diani. She's my, my lead character. She's my, I know how to draw the ladies. Um, and, yeah. uh, he sees her transform back from the deer, you know, in this scene. So um, this is kind of like a flashback. Oh, she's uh, a deer? Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. She, uh, yeah. Like, look at this. Like, just the way he lit the nighttime. And just yeah. things like this. Like, when I rendered this, I did all of this, the, the trees and everything. I love doing silhouettes like this where you just black out parts of the background. Yeah. It's then actually when the color very comes, impactful. Yeah, it's uh, it just pops and and like here, you know, there's so much shadow in this shot because they're inside the cabin at night. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I hope everybody's excited about this because this book, I'm putting everything. I mean, I'm, I'm following the Ethan model where you put everything into every panel, every page you possibly can, uh, you know, to to make it the best it can be. I'm I'm not sleeping on this project. He did it again here. See see how he grayed out blued mm -hmm. out the foreground of the hand so you would focus more on the blood. You know, he could have yeah. just colored it flesh tones like this, but he grayed it out, you know, yeah. and yeah. I, that's, that's a good colorist right there. I mean, that's, that's somebody who's doing their job. I think, you know, they so. go, Corey, that's some good tips right there <laughs> when it comes to coloring. Uh, Cause what, one thing we've always had trouble with is, is making characters stand out from the background. And it's only recently that a scene like the one you were just showing. Uh, this is, it, this it is makes, massive spoilers. <laughs> yeah, it, Sorry guys. <laughs> but it, it, it actually makes sense to, to have the character with blue on them against the orange background. Cause that orange is a backlight anyway. Yeah. Mm, right. Well, and like this, see the sun, I said, I, I just said, like, I'll give him notes. I'll say, I want the sun going down. Okay. So he knows what I want, you know, and he goes in and he lights this, this beautiful, I mean, this mm. is, this is reminiscent, obviously of, you know, Jesus and Mary, right? I mean, it, that's what, oh, yeah. you, that's what it feels like. It's mother Mary and Jesus, you know, and he's, mm. he's being flogged and everything and they're all laughing at him and they're sort of humoring her like, Oh, you know, the, the Indian princess, yeah, let her come in and do her little pagan ritual and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Little do they know, <laughs> she's bringing him his pelt so he can wolf out and basically wipe out the whole fort. You know, Dude, so, awesome. yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's you know, it's great to put things in historical context because I love history. To mm. me, history is fascinating because you, it's like going to another planet, right? Mm -hmm. It's such a different world than we live in politically, yeah. socially, everything, that um, it's really easy 
to put things in that world and it you you know that that uh, feels alien to us you know what i mean like um mm -hmm. so yeah love is colors and actually this is 10 percent desaturation i have him go back and uh <laughs> yeah rob I, I must be reincarnated i was at pickett's charge yeah i gave those mm -hmm. yankees try to get those yankees a whooping but they still beat us um this <laughs> i have him uh I have him desaturate. I don't know if you guys do this, but I have him desaturate every page by 10%. So when he yeah. gives me a page, he, they're very saturated, but because it's sort of in the past and historical, I, I try to tone it down a little bit. So I just have him do it do at 10%. That? You do? Okay. I didn't know if I was the only one that did that. I also brighten the page uh, a bit as well because sometimes it it can appear just you know when it when it prints it's going to be way too dark so uh, yeah. The, yeah printing uh, brightening and then desaturating a bit and also uh, desaturation incorporates or introduces a more realistic aesthetic. it does yeah if you're going for something that's a little more I don't want to say on the serious side, but just a little less mm. uh, sort of superhero, you know, kind of yeah. vibe. I feel like sometimes the saturation needs to come down a little bit. Uh, and that's why I have him do it. And sometimes I second guess it. I'm like, well, am I like, am I downplaying his beautiful colors by doing that? Should I not be doing that? But then I see what I get back and I'm like, nah, it's, it's good. It's, it's got enough mm. saturation. It doesn't need more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Man, you are just throwing. Oh, go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Like he's, like he might not do as much detail as us, but you're pretty damn fast at just throwing down the lines without caring. Oh, thanks. So, yeah, well, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just I, I love inking more than I love penciling. Like to me, penciling is is sort of the necessary evil. <laughs> You know, like I'm not one of those artists, you know, I love artists that can sit down and they'll do this beautiful pencil page. And I'm like, dude, that's going to be inked over. Why are you spending so much time with your feathering and your rendering unless you're giving it to somebody else? If you're inking it yourself, it doesn't, to me, make sense to draw it twice. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you look, look at how terrible that looks like. That's just like a scribble you'd see on a, on a thumbnail. But I know, I already know what I want in my head. So I'm just using this as a guideline for where I want things to be. And then mm -hmm. when I when I go in there, I mean that's very simplistic. There's really not much going on there. You know, it's chicken scratch. Mm -hmm. But I kind of I kind of the the philosophy that you have about don't pin it down too early because then it loses a little bit of that spontaneity. You know? Yeah. Absolutely, man. That's so true. And uh, yeah, I think one of the, uh, some of the enjoyment that you probably get out of inking is the fact that you're not rehashing stuff you've already done. Yeah. You know, the final line work, it's, it's being constructed right there with the inks and those pencils are just serving as a guide. So I completely relate. And I remember that it used to be quite difficult for me to just jump into the inks with a rough sketch, but Man, you, you you take the dive, you practice doing it for a week, and before you know it, you, you're super comfortable with it. Now, there's different levels to it. You know, you've got uh, Ethan Van Skyver, for example, who's just got very uh, abstract uh, yeah. sketch lines that he's mm -hmm. placed out of the page, and somehow yeah. this immaculate-looking piece of intricate inked artwork comes out of it. Um, now I'm not at that stage yet. That's for sure. I still got to take well, my time, get the proportions man. down, get the structure there, and that can take. Uh, you know, if I'll be honest with you, if I've got a page that I really want to get right, well, that penciling stage is important. So I'll take a, a, a full day. In some instances, I know Murph is probably like, "What the hell are you talking about? A full day? I've completed <laughs> a fully inked page within a full day." But um, well, it yeah, depends. I, I've it's, got to get those proportions and poses and, and perspectives right before I can feel comfortable inking. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. This cover, this is a double-page spread. This is the back cover. Or not spread. This is a uh, wraparound cover. So this is the back and this is the front. This cover took me almost about a week to, to yeah. draw an ink. I mean, it, it was not... It wasn't like, well, it's two pages, so two days. No. <laughs> so yeah. it, just to draw all these guys, just to... You know what takes the longest for me is layout, like figuring out yeah. who's going where, is the yep. perspective right, 
it, where's the negative space? The drawing part is really not the hard part. It's it's figuring out a good layout, a good composition, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's it, it's really, really cool. Um, and, and big hello to everyone who's joined us in the chat. I see you all there hanging out, talking to one another. Man, I, I love catching up and and watching a, a talented artist like Murph draw and and chatting about it. It's it's so cool. And we're able to do it live. Man, this is another thing I, I love about the whole crowdfunding comic book movement is just the engagement and interaction we're able to cultivate with the fans. You know, they're able to tune in and watch you create this freaking comic real time. And yeah. That's a better than a making of DVD, man. Yeah. It's like being at a, a comic con 24 hours a day. And you know? like, like, you know, I feel like we're, we're constantly having our own conventions and panels and, you know, and just doing our own thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, a comic skate. This whole thing has just been great. Cause I'm telling you, I gave up on comics back in 2010. Or oh, I was man, done. Really? Yeah, I was done. I was, I said, I'm done with this field. You can't make any money in it. It's not rewarding anymore. It's, uh, you know, I was, this no, was back when I was still distributing through diamond, you know, and, and everything. I wasn't, there was no crowdfunding or any of that stuff. Um, and it wasn't until I started following, uh, EVS and, uh, your boy Zach and, and just sort of seeing what was happening with comic skate. And I thought, wow, okay, there's a whole nother model, a whole nother business model going on here where mm -hmm. you can, you can reach new fans and, uh, you offer them a quality product and they'll, they'll support you, you know? Um, so that's when I thought, okay, let me give this a go again so if it wasn't for comic skate i wouldn't be doing a comic book right now because i was working in animation i'd be doing animation only and now i do both so wow yeah that 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 is amazing man it's uh you're, you're right selling comic books on your own as an indie back before comic skate was around in before crowdfunding because i'm guessing there were some people doing it uh fairly successfully before comic skate but they were very few and, and far in between. So, um, and as I said before, crowdfunding came along. Uh, getting a comic book out there was expensive, really, mm. really expensive, and just uh, near impossible. Uh, you, you could maybe, you know, if crowdfunding went away tomorrow and Comic Skate went around away tomorrow, you could still take what you've learned from that and build a fairly successful business model. But I think what you would be missing is that. Uh, camaraderie with with other creators, that collaboration, and also the uh, you know the community aspect of it. Um, well, you can make your own fan base and stuff, and and get them interested in your comic book. But when you've got a bunch of creators doing comic books, and all of their fans are, are fans of your stuff as well, because they're, they're just you know that that energy is there, the, the hype for the comic books is there. Uh, that that's going to be much more rejuvenating for an industry absolutely yeah and i think uh it, it keeps you from becoming a diva because like when you have when the fans have access to you or the readers have pretty much constant access to you um mm -hmm. you, you're not there's there's not that distance anymore where you're like i'm over here doing my comic and i'll see you guys at the next convention and i'll sit behind a table and sign autographs you know because that's how yeah. it used to be it was um, it, that you weren't really, you know, there was, there was a little bit of that Hollywood kind of I'm a minor celebrity kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. And you can't really do that anymore. Uh, I don't yeah. think uh, fans will stand for it. You know, like they, they won't put up with it anymore. They, they, want, they want you mm -hmm. to be uh, accessible and they want you to be um, accountable. Like you're accountable to yeah. them and what they want. And um, it's not just about you, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, mm. and that's the thing. It it never has been. Like, we, we're nothing without the fans, without the backers. Like, we don't have a business without them. So it is, uh, it is funny how some people can just get, you know, a little bit blinded uh, by their, their own ego, thinking that it's all them and whatnot. Like, yeah, you're, you're creating the product and stuff, but... What good is that if you're the only one who's going to be able to, to appreciate it and experience it? No, right. you, you need the fan base there. So um, I, 
Yeah, I think that you're 100% spot on there. And the other thing I love, especially about these streams, is just um, like you know that we're we're here, right? And mm. so, like, instead of us just you know crowdfunding our comic book and disappearing for the next year while we produce it, if we end up producing it ultimately, uh, you can tune in most days throughout the week and see us, see that we're still working on it, see right. that we're still talking about it. And, um, well, and you that's can reassuring. Send right? an email that's really uh, like angry or something, like a guy sent you. Yeah, sometimes you get angry emails. But if, uh, if the chat, Clayton, if you can do me a favor, if the chat's ask, ever asking me questions, because I'm not looking at the chat. Oh, yeah. Just uh, yeah. just let me know because I don't I'm I'm not even looking at it unfortunately. Oh no, that's that's all good, man. I'll I'll definitely uh, let you in on the loop. Lots of people saying hello, tuning in. I uh, got comics talk with uh, with pops here, pops Van Zant. Man, it's it's good to see you. I hope 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 we can get you on here one day as well, uh, Mister Von Stugel. Uh, he says um, Murph could have named her uh, Makit Makitu to Samu. Uh, two, although they may have to change the tribe. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it needs to be pronounceable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know uh, the problem with uh, Native American names is you know if they're if they're you don't want your protagonist to have a name that's hard to say. That's that's like the that's like having a title that's hard to say, you know, of your book. So Diani is very sort of manageable. You know, yeah, it's it's got to be easy to remember. Yeah. Um, Wait, so is there like a reason she's a deer? Well, Diani yeah. actually stands for deer. It's uh, right. it's out, it's Algonquin for deer. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, That's but um, no, I I just wanted her something swift and fast, and you know, sort of feminine. I mean, you know, we th we think of deer, we think more of you know, it's kind of a you just think more of like a feminine type animal. At least I do. Um, oh, yeah. so I didn't want to make her, I want to make her something kind of elegant. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. I consider deer to be very elegant, you know, animals. So, uh, hell yeah, crap. man. So, uh, what brush are you using here in Manga Studio? The G pen? Yeah, I just, I don't even change the size. <laughs> I pick the size I'm happy with and, you know, and you can see, I mean, you get pretty thick, see? Yeah. So I, I just I don't waste time bouncing back and forth. I probably should experiment with more uh, nibs and things. And when I finally one day upgrade to um, or what is it? Um, ah, I don't even remember the name of the the replacement oh, that okay. that everybody uses. Uh, it's not manga. It's not called manga studio anymore. It's, it's uh, uh, clip studio paint. Clip studio. Thank you. Clip studio yeah. paint. Yeah, that's the upgrade or the new version, whatever. So it's not that different, actually. The yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, I started War Party in this program, and rather than try to start, you know, in a whole new sort of setup, I was just like, well, let me just at least finish out this series with this, yeah. uh, you know, and then I'll I'll take some time in the future and and make that upgrade when the time comes. Absolutely. Yeah, you know? man, you just you seem to have so much uh, confidence when you're ranking, like. And, and it appears like you don't care, but I know you care. But but that's the sign of a pro, right? Like they make it look easy. Well, I mean, it's here's the thing: it's far from perfect, right? I mean, you gotta just say, you gotta accept your uh, what is uh, Clint Eastwood said? I can't remember which Dirty Harry. A man's gotta know his limitations. <laughs> yeah, you know, man's gotta know his limitations. Uh, yeah. I know my limitations. You know, uh, this? you know what I mean? So I don't, uh, Sorry. Huh? I was going to say name meaning she has large knockers. <laughs> they're not that big. They're, they're a solid C cup. I think I don't think they're quite D's. Um, yeah. well, you know, it's funny because, uh, you don't realize a lot of people don't realize this, but native Americans do not have body hair. Um, oh. so when the Europeans saw the native women, they were enamored by how smooth their skin was because they had no hair on their legs, no hair anywhere, just the head and I think pubic region. That's it. They, they do not, they're hairless men and women, um, on their body. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's just a genetic thing. Um, so, you know, it, it made the women quite, uh, alluring 
the European men because they had never seen that before. You know, they're used to women in Europe with their hairy legs and hairy armpits. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <You know>? <laughs> so you know, um, yeah. Oh man, it, it it is really interesting to um to focus on history within a comic book within a story because culture just changes so much over time. And, you know, what was completely normal yesterday um, and completely acceptable ends up not being and vice versa, right? Things that weren't acceptable yesterday become completely normal and acceptable. And, you know, fashion changes, uh, hairstyle changes, attitudes end up shifting. And uh, it is quite interesting to observe the, the evolution of of society in that sense is and, and then the impact it has on our everyday life so mm. you know just looking at what you're illustrating here Murph, like these are uh tools and structures and architectures uh weaponry that we we've never experienced firsthand for the most part and uh, and it's cool that in your in a story like this, uh, we do in some senses we get to jump into that world for just a little while, uh, as long as the book lasts, and um, and and really engage with that moment in time. Yeah, and the thing is, you don't really have to understand how things work. It's a weird thing when it comes to accuracy. The the reason why accuracy is important is not so that. The reader goes, "Oh, I, you know, I never knew a cannon worked that way." Mm. You just, you just, it's a subliminal thing. Like when they're watching it and they see these things they've never seen before, and you know, and the way things function, it gives it a sense of authenticity. Whether they know mm. what's real or not, it doesn't really matter. Totally, it just helps enrich the world. You know, I mean, this mm. would lose all credibility if I had people running down, running around with bolt action rifles. You know, or yeah, you, you, you've got to, if you're going to pick a period in history to tell a story, then get the history right. Otherwise, stay out of history. I mean, that's my my view is if you're going to be historical, you better you better take the time to make it accurate as possible, at least with regards to uniforms and clothing and weapons and vehicles and and even mm -hmm. political things like who is fighting who and why and, you know, Oh, for sure, man. All, all of that Absolutely. stuff plays into it. Even though this is a fantasy horror, you know, adventure, it's not a historical, you know, book mm -hmm. or anything. You still want to get the history, I, at least I do, want to get it as accurate as possible. You know? Yeah, big time. It, it, Man, that's another really funny uh, topic to unpack, actually, is uh, the moment – the moments in history that are like super controversial now um, that that people find uh, unacceptable, even though it was it was part of history. Uh, so yeah. I always like to refer to uh, the Bible for this. So just hear me out for a second, right? So th there's a lot of like crazy shit that happens in the Bible, right? Oh yeah. Uh, I, I was listening to just the the audio book series. Um, I'm not not overly religious, spiritual man, but not overly religious. But I wanted to listen to it because we're doing like you know fantasy comic books and stuff, and so right. I figured, hey, you know, there's probably some you know burning bushes and premonitions and whatnot. There's probably some inspiration in here somewhere. Plus, there's a large part of the world that. Uh, that believes in this stuff and i should probably uh you know look into it actually uh listen to it within my lifetime uh, i can't i can't read something that big so i listened to it just while i was working and yeah some crazy things happen you know attitudes toward you know things like uh like women and men and and this and that and so uh in the modern era of course uh many people will be like well you know it was you know very misogynistic and this and that um or you, you shouldn't believe in it because it was like this or that and it's like well actually uh it's it's a little bit more it, it's less of a a rule book and more of a historical retelling of a time in history um of a of a and and so um, I think that it's important to, to keep that and stuff in mind when we're looking back at our journey as humans and, and the different evolutions that we have gone through. Like, 
yes, things might be unacceptable to us now, but back then it was very, very normal. Yeah. And yeah, let's let's own that. I mean, yeah, none of us were there at the time. Um, like, but it's it's like th- there's a certain peace that comes with saying, "Well, it was it was different a different time." Yeah, we've come a long way. Well, I don't I don't know where this idea came from today that the history was supposed to conform to what people think today. It's the most yeah, it's the most ridiculous, it. ignorant, stupid thing I've ever heard of. And truthfully, it's incredibly self righteous because yeah. who the hell is this generation? to look back at past generations and judge them. What makes them so righteous and good and holy and all this nonsense Mm -hmm. that they think they're, maybe they need to take a look at themselves and, and address the own, their own pride, how they think they're better than people in the past, you know, because when I go to a place like Gettysburg and I see, you know, the monuments on both Mm -hmm. sides and I witness the bravery that both sides inhabited. And then I see somebody tear down a statue of a soldier, whether they be Union or Confederate, it disgusts really? me because these people's bravery was on a level yeah. that people yeah. today, very few people today would be willing to to sacrifice. They wouldn't. Yeah, man. Yeah, so they're, in my opinion, they're the better person, not yeah. you who think you're so righteous because you tweet <laughs> all day long and, and virtue signal. You know, yeah, so it's always it's, selfish. You know. Well, it's yeah, it's it is actually, man, such a beautiful way of putting it, Murph. Um, yeah, like mm-hmm. if 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 people today truly believe that people in the past uh, were a certain way in a negative sense, then uh, that should help inform them that they could very well be wrong too. Exactly. Be- <laughs> you will be judged. Judge not, lest. You will be yeah. judged, right? If you want to quote the Bible. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, it's yeah, interesting, I, I, right? And, and, you know, I, I'm not ch- trying to bring this up to be controversial. I see Replicator in the chat. He's like, okay, we've lost the stream now. But uh, I, I like thinking about this in a storytelling sense because these yeah. are issues that, that come up in, mm. in narrative all the time. You know, some of the best movies uh, and books deal with it. So it's definitely something to engage with to indulge in from time to time and, and just think about it you know especially doing like a, a, a fantasy book like Corey and i are where we're creating a world that has its own rules that has its own yeah. culture and and aspects to its society that uh need to work in in a mechanical sensing whether whether that be good or bad and um and you're creating like a an, an ethos almost well and what's you're great about fantasy war. What's great about the fantasy, even with the world you're creating, you can still look back at history to get ideas. Oh, yeah. And that's that's what's cool about it. Uh, it helps make your yeah, fantasy like the, world more real. Like, I know the plague was pretty bad, but it's, like, it's kind of an interesting thing to put in a book if you're putting, like, sickness yeah. and medicine. Because they all had crazy ideas about what medicine was as well. Right. Absolutely. And you can take some of those ideas like um you know you might just take let's say like probably you know back back in biblical times and you could easily apply this to something like um you know in a fantasy world you know someone who is you know crazy maybe not completely sane would be like possessed by demons and or burnt at the stake right, right. Uh, if, if they ran into some good luck or, or whatever or their their mm. enemies were struck down oh that's a witch right there must be burnt at the stake but here's the thing even though we know that's silly what if in our fantasy story, there was actually some truth to that. All of a sudden, it becomes a whole lot more interesting. Right, right. Um, well, I, one of my characters in the book is uh, the guy who's the bear. He's the uh, the oldest brother. He yeah. um, He's very religious, and he doesn't want to put on the the man put on the uh the pelt and become a bear because he feels like it's witchcraft it's it's cool it's paganist you know like it would he'd be like selling his soul or lose his soul or go to hell if he did this yeah. and he turned into this animal and uh what's funny is one of the characters is he's like flipping through the bible trying to find something to justify why he should put on the thing and become the bear and there's a story where um i, I can't remember who it was it was um it was a prophet might have been elijah some oh, kids yeah. were some kids were were um like yeah. harassing him 
And apparently God called a bear out of the woods and the bear yeah. came and devoured the children. <laughs> and I was like, that's perfect. You know, cause it's like an example of God and it's a bear, you know? So I was like, that might be a way he could convince the guy. Cause I thought, why would everybody want to do this? Not everybody I would be on board with this. Like I'm going to put on this animal skin and let this, you know, this shaman put something in my body and turn me into a monster. I'm not going to do that. You know? So I tried to make it where there's a little bit of a conflict there in the war party itself, and not everybody's on board with this, but of course they need him because grizzly bears are like the most powerful, one of the most powerful land animals. So um, when he, you know, they need him because when he, when he hulks out, he's, you know, he's enormous. He's like, he's like 14 feet tall and uh, he's a lot stronger than the other ones. So just little things like that to make characters, um, a little more three dimensional, you know, so they're not just yeah. Let's do this, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um. And hey, Ray, that's a that's a really good point. Um. Yeah, it was different times, and so in different times, you're dealing with a different set of rules and uh, ways of being. And you know, in some senses, uh, right now is is quite a strange time to live in, uh, because of uh the way in which our attitudes have formed due to the, the additional freedoms that we have, the lack of uh, pressure and threat. Um, and, you know, our, our brain is our brain is still evolving to catch up with that, in fact. Our, our social uh, abilities are still trying to catch up with it. Like how are we as human beings that have been around for so many million years, billion years or whatever it is, how are we in a matter of only, um, you know, let's say a, a century – how just a tiny little tiny amount of time how are we able to catch our biology our, our brain and our, our psychology up to the fact that all of a sudden we're not socializing in person anymore we're not inter interacting in person we're in, we're interacting with more people than ever but it's completely virtual like how, yeah. how does our how does our how do we as people even begin to adapt to that we're still in that learning process for sure um you know wars have been had and whatnot and it's only very recently you know you think about the fact that you know your great grandfather maybe even your your grandfather was at war mm -hmm. you know world, world war ii and how not long ago that was and then you compare it to where we're living now in, in the times that we're in it's uh, it's really it's kind of scary. In fact, you know, well, you can't, you can't that make that you can't make that comparison because then Lucasfilm will fire you. <laughs> well, better you. quit. You better quit making those comparisons right now because yeah. uh, history, putting history in context, is not a good thing. They want you to, you know, yeah. they want to erase yeah. history. Um, yeah, I'll sure I'll get some flack in this book about you know. The hmm. fact that not na not every Native American character in this book is, um, you know, Pocahontas running around spreading hmm. love and colors of the wind because they weren't. <laughs> I mean, there, yeah. there was some incredible brutality going on uh, on oh, both yeah. sides, you know, and um, you know that's just the reality. You, you know, you can pretend like it didn't exist, but it did. And, um, and there's no massive political discussion the characters randomly get into exactly there's no there's no if this is all about survival this world was survival yeah. you did what you had yeah. to do to live i mean it was that I simple and you that. did whatever you had to do to live this was a wild frontier no rules no regulations yeah i mean when they captured a lot of the british soldiers uh, braddock's men were, were defeated and they they captured them uh the uh, the Huron Indians uh, tied them up by the bank and oh, set yeah. them on fire, burned them alive by the bank, and the French just stood there and let them do it. They didn't stop him and say, "Well, this isn't you know gentlemanly. We shouldn't be doing this to prisoners." They just stood back mm. and let let them burn these men alive by the banks yeah. or the river. So I, it, it you know that's what I mean when I say it was there was really no quarter. Um, so I thought that's a great setting to put something like this, you know, and what better place to put a werewolf story than, you know, the French and Indian war with, with all this violence. And, um, it's perfect, man. It yeah. Can. And I mean, you, you run away from the army and they, to go save your daughter and they flog you to death, you know, like, like they call you a deserter and, and beat you, you know, on, on a whip you in front of the rest of the men. That's how brutal it was. 
Could you imagine today in the military if they said your punishment is 30 lashes in front of the regiment? Yeah. That would never be tolerated today. No. But then oh, that's yeah. how they used to do it. I mean, they'd beat you. They'd brand you with hot irons. They, they'd kill oh, they, They'd hang you, you know, for running well, away. Like mm-hmm. these days, they're literally, um, they're making it easier for women getting into the army while they change up the training specifically so they can complete it. Yeah, that's true. Like it's pretty different. Which is, well, um, yeah. Sensitivity training, you know, and all that. Here's the thing. There have been lots of great women fighters in history. You've got Utica, yeah. the barbarian who took on the Roman Empire. you awesome. got... Yeah, you got, uh, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth, who was like a warrior. Mm. You know, you have Mary, Queen of Scots. You have um, lots of female Russian snipers in World War II. So some of the best snipers in World War II were Russian women. But they did not not change the requirements for those women. Those women could do it as well as the men could. So there's the difference is, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And... Yeah, I mean, and you're talking about the modern day, honestly, which is a very, very different time. Like, I'm, I know that, uh, man, if if I, someone put me in the army, I wouldn't make a cut, make the cut. <laughs> like, I, I'd be much weaker than than a military woman, probably. In all honesty, like, I, Dude, I wouldn't you'd be, be like, like I would be able to walk as long, run as long. I'd probably you have um, endless rant. Basically. I'd probably injure myself, like like <laughs> shooting a gun, like so. You know, again, we're we're in a different time where, uh, where even the manliest of men could stand a stand to man up even more. <laughs> what do you guys think about this? Because, like, I heard they're cutting Wolverine's cigarette out of like comics, like of the, course. the originals, right? Yeah, like that's almost like history altering because See, we think I'm about comics about. when it's like we look back to. It's like some George Orwell. Well, uh, no, what it is, what it is, is anything that's uh, anything that's traditionally masculine: guns, Mm. smoking, drinking, womanizing, looking at hot women. What you know, cheesecake photos, pinups, war, anything Mm. that's aggressive or masculine. They're trying to purge out of society yeah. they're trying to make men into women basically is what they're trying to do um yeah so you know and that's never going to work because it's in our nature uh yeah violence yeah. is in our nature um there's a reason why my wife goes to zumba to work out and i go to boxing okay yeah. <laughs> it's because i want to hit stuff she wants to dance yep right she's a woman exactly. i'm a man we have different needs and things we want to do in our with our fitness. So you mean uh, you have to be exactly the same? What? <laughs> yeah. So it's um, that's not to say there. And like I said, there's always exceptions. There's men who don't like guns, or men who don't like to aren't aggressive, and women who do. You know, so I was just, I was watching a video the other day of a guy that trained his nine year old daughter, and she could shoot. Anything. I mean, she she, she goes out on the range and she's like picks up a shotgun, empty, empties it out, and then she goes to the next station, picks up a forty five, starts hitting the targets. She's nine mm-hmm. years old, but her daddy trained her to do that. You know, he taught her how to shoot. You know, and she's better than most grown men <laughs> with a gun. Yeah, that's amazing, man. So it just depends. Yeah. You know, but there are yeah. general sort of gender things. You know, I have to force my wife to watch a war movie. She has to force me to watch a romantic comedy, you know. Totally. <laughs> it's so, it's. I mean, that's what's real, right? Like, you can uh, you can put out a Twitter post and have some ideal interweaved into it, but uh, ultimately, um, you know, what people uh, say they want isn't necessarily uh, what they react to or what their daily experience of life is like. Like, what we say might sound great. But um, you know, yeah. actions speak louder than words. And at the at the end of the day, a majority of men or women are going to be into different sorts of things. Now, that doesn't mean that they should be just confined to that, right? People should have the not. freedom, but don't say, "Hey, you have to be into man shit if you're a woman, and you have to be non-masculine if you're a man," like because that's just confining people still. So. 
you know, again, Terry Crews said it best, regardless of how controversial you find it, uh, you don't want to swap one oppressor for another. Um, you know, if you want, if you want real change, uh, then you've just, you know, you got to, what we've been working toward for so long as human beings is freedom, the the freedom to, to be ourselves and to, you know, create, yeah. to, to express. Uh, but also, well, yeah, time, yeah. we want to help the community. You know, that's what a, a community is. Well, yeah, so well, I don't right. want freedom anymore, man, because... Well, it, yeah, you're right, you're right. You know, I yeah. know plenty of women who just want to be free to be womanly. And it's like they're, yeah. they're, they're trying to cut that out and restrict it. It's like yeah. you have to be more like a man or something. Well, there's yeah. something called the Titler cycle. Look it up, the Titler cycle, and it goes through every stage in human history where once you achieve a certain level of freedom and prosperity, you start falling into apathy and mm -hmm. uh, complacency, and then you end up turning into dependency and then back into bondage again, and then it leads back to faith, revolt, freedom, <laughs> prosperity, <laughs> apathy, bondage, yeah, faith. Yeah. Like, like, And right now we're in the apathy bondage or, or apathy dependency phase, yeah. getting ready to go into bondage, unfortunately. Uh, so what's what's bondage then? Totalitarian governments not having freedom. Uh, yeah, in other words, you get complacent because things are so good that you quit mm. trying and you quit protecting the yeah. things that made it good to begin with. Then you start losing those things, and before mm. you know it, you look around and it's not good anymore. You've and then yeah, you've got to really fight bad. for it. Yeah, again. It you go back to the same, and that's just it keeps going. It's called the Titler cycle. That's weird. Yeah, like, why would you want to give up your freedoms? Like, why would just, you want? Because you've never been without them. Yeah. So, in other words, when someone comes mm. here from a communist country, they don't want socialism because they've been there and they know what it's like. And they're like, I, I came here to be free. Why are we going back to where the place that I came from? That's not. But see, yeah. when you've had it all and you're pampered and spoiled, you think, yeah, you know, we the government should do this and do that. And, you know. And I don't know how we got in politics. We're supposed to be talking about making comic books. Sorry, yeah. chat. <laughs> so, That's okay. I, how do you yeah. make comic books? Talk about politics while you draw, apparently. <laughs> yeah. well, it, like, it just it grabs me up when they're, they're mm. changing literally the history of comics. Like Wolverine mm. smoking like a big like cigarette or cigar or something. Cigar, like yeah. It's like it was iconic. It was part of his yeah. image, and he used to call like yeah. older women like Dahl or something. Yeah, and princess. And it was just his character, right? But Corey, as well, man. Keep in mind, right? That that's what's so great about what you know, bringing it back to the comics. That's what's great about what we're doing. That's what great is great about what yeah. Murph is doing, and all of the other independents, not just in comics, but in the music industry, in the mu movie industry, who are doing it. Uh, for the art, because they're they're really passionate about it, not to push uh, an agenda. I mean, yeah, mm. yes, you know what they're they're pushing their own ideas and stuff. Of course, you know they've got a narrative that they want to express. But um, the the thing is, is it's not it's not so black and white when it comes to the independence. It could really be anything because it's so individual and it's from the heart. It, it's from their mind, and so I think that. We're, we're really being the, the change that we want to see by doing this stuff. And, yes, it's hard work to go out there on your own and to create a comic book from scratch. I mean, that that's a tough thing. But I, I think that it's what the readers want. It's what the creators want the freedom to be able to do. And if enough of us do it, you know, we're, we're streaming out there to the How to Draw Comics group right now that has a lot of up-and-coming artists, a lot of pro artists. Um, who are all passionate about exactly what we're passionate about, which is creating kick-ass comic books. And so yeah. now you've got the opportunity to do it on your own. You know, that, that 60,000-plus group of people within the How to Draw Comics community, you don't have to worry about competition anymore. Um, the only competition you have to worry about is, in a sense, yourself. Right. Like you've got to make sure that you're pushing your skill set to the next level so that your work stands out. But the brilliant thing is that's in your control. Be the epitome of what you can be as an artist. Otherwise, why do it? So yeah, man. Uh, I think that this is why like, I'm so optimistic, man. I think that the, the place that we're at politically and in society in general, it's it's funny 
and you can laugh at it and you can talk about it. But at the end of the day, it, there's a lot of positivity to it in the sense that it's evening the playing field. In other words, all of a sudden, we are able to compete with Marvel and DC because of the content we're putting out, because of our ideas and the power yeah, exactly. and ability to be able to do it, to create our own. Well, and, yeah, and you called it. See, they're they're shackled. They have yeah. to make stuff within a certain box because yep. they've created it, It's of their own mm. design. They've created a box, a very rigid set of requirements that if those are not met, they cannot tell that story, Right. We can yeah. tell any story we want because we've put no shackles on ourselves. So exactly. that's the edge we have over the Thank mainstream. You. Yes, we have complete freedom. Then. It's like um, it's like if you could walk into a comic book store, right? Uh, let's say there's two different comic book stores, one on the right side of the street, the other on the left. And uh, and by the way, that's there's there's no political uh, connection no with what I just said. Just so you know, like they can exactly like right? what you're trying to do. And, and one of the comments, one of the comments. Do you want to go for the right side of the street? Or uh, one, one of the comic book stores. Um, they they've only got you know basically one type of comic book: superhero comic books that um, have a fairly consistent message. In other words, the story is pretty much about the same thing. There's, there's all different, there's little differences, but they all have the same message essentially, right? So you got that comic book store. But then mm. on the other side, you've got a comic book store that you just don't know what you're going to get. It could be anything. It could be weird. It could be interesting. It could be scary. It could be action-packed. It could be, uh, you know, whatever. And, and you know that what you're going to get there is unique. You know that it's going to be something which is created to the highest level of quality possible. Why? Because it's full of independent creators who aren't part of a big corporation mass producing product. In fact, you can maybe only get these comic books at this store and nowhere else, right? So think of it that way. Which store would you rather be walking through? I know for me that... I need something to keep my interest, to reignite my passion for comic books, for collecting them. And I know that I'm going to be able to collect way more interesting titles uh, from the comic book store that's got more to offer. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah totally. Man, that's what we're creating. That's what we're creating, I mean, guys. And that's what's so exciting about it. Oh, yeah, I think about it, it's like, I think about the basic instincts of a human, like violence. Mm -hmm sex yeah you know and that's, that's basically stuff, what i man. want in the book i want yeah, well, attractive looking women and monsters that's that's slow you know? that's so deeply ingrained uh as i said in it's hard it's hardwired in all of us and so that's why uh we oftentimes find it appealing now if you try to yeah. repress that it's only going to get worse right like well yeah people, we we resist and that's the thing what's happening is if they tell us that we're toxically masculine, we're just going to put more masculinity into our books. I mean, yeah. you, you want to see toxically masculine? I'll give it to you. Like, I yeah. I will give you so much toxic masculinity in this book, you won't be able to take it. So, you know, don't yeah. tell me I can't write something or draw something because I'll just do it ten times more. Um, and guess what? Yeah. Guess what? When Murph does that, he's going to get a large readership. That's the funny thing because – you can't get it anywhere else. Yeah, like when I go to when one of the stories in the future takes place during the Civil War. Well, guess whose side Diani's going to be on? You know, the the ignorant masses don't realize that the vast majority of Native Americans sided with the Confederacy because they hated the federal government. The federal government took their land away, right, mm -hmm. and committed was committing genocide against them. So who are they yeah. going to side with? The federal government? Or the people trying to break away from the federal government, they join yeah. the most of them join the South. So go. it's going to be very interesting when they realize that there were all these Cherokee, you know, and uh, uh, Indians fighting for the Confederacy, you know, during the Civil War. So, uh, yeah. and it's factual. Yeah, you know? man, and um, that's what that's what's so awesome, man, and that that creates a brilliant story writing element when you throw when you throw people off. And but they're like, going to hate hey, that. They're going to oh, hate that because here's my minority yeah. woman, my leading minority woman of fighting for the rebels. <laughs> yeah. You know? So 
it's brilliant but that's that's the thing man like people um they they believe that they're so informed but they're more uninformed than ever these days and it's because they there's a large part of reality and history that they simply don't want to accept and that they would choose to literally erase from the right. record books but um yeah. that's just that's just you um that, that's not being true to to yourself or, or anybody else it's not being true to, to mankind really because um you, you can't just uh put some pretty makeup on on our human history and what we've created and pretend that it's always been perfect sunshine and lollipops because well, it hasn't history is something and that's what makes that's what from, gives man. us depth as human beings man like we've been through the shit and believe it or not it's funny that the West worries about this stuff the most, right? When like 70 to 80% of the rest of the world is still in the shitter. Stuck like, in the dark ages. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. But you know, it's because like, we have, we have, the, we, want to help we, have, someone. we have the luxury to worry about it. That's the reason. That's my point. Yeah. In other words, mm. people that have real problems don't worry about the things we're talking about. No way, man. They're focused yeah. on, uh, you yeah. know, surviving each day. Survival, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, um, it'll it'll pass. I mean, if art is important because art is, you know, the way you can. I'm not going to say shape opinion, but what I mean is because I don't want to sound like, oh, well, we're doing this to, you know, we have an agenda. But what I'm saying right. is that art, art is what gives people uh, escape. Yes, you know, and and. People will turn to that, especially in times when they really need it. You know, they're where they're being bombarded with politics and everything they read and see. They just want yeah. a story. Can I just get a story? Yeah. Do I have to be preached at in my comics, in my movies, and in my TV series? And my, you know, do I always I have to hear politics? Like yeah. people just want to. Like people love listening to stories, like good do, stories man. and stuff. And you do you know. know what? There's a lot of messed up stories out there. Like, I mean, so the stories you're... Like, I'd rather uh, a messed up story over Miss Marvel playing on her iPhone. My my missus, book, <laughs> my missus <laughs> mum, who goes to book club, reads, like, messed up stories. Like, the reality is, is that everything is not going to be perfect. And if, if it was, people wouldn't be into it anyway. Like, right. Um, well, and I mean... There's nothing wrong with putting if you want to put like a message in the subtext of your story, yeah. that's fine. But it's just people I I like politics and I'm exhausted. I'm tired of hearing about politics and I like it's politics. Kind of boring after a while, you know. Well, mm -hmm. I can only imagine a person who doesn't like it at all and never followed it and they're just being bombarded with it daily. They can't even turn on ESPN and watch a football game anymore. Like it's it's well, gotten insane. I don't get why politics has become such a cool thing to uh, talk about and be so into. Like, like when I was in school, I didn't give a shit about politics. I don't like. I don't, sometimes I don't even know who our prime minister is. Well, it became yeah, cool in the '60s. Like, I know more about American stuff. Right. It became cool in the '60s during Vietnam, and then it and then it faded away in the '80s. When and that's why I love the '80s. The '80s is just about having fun. <laughs> You know, just yeah, just live it like movies. Yeah, and um, and then uh, it started to come back after nine eleven a little bit with the Bush era, and then when Obama got elected, it started to become the whole race issue started to come to the forefront more than I'd ever seen in my life. And then, of course, Trump just put it over. So we've never recovered. Like it's just continually gone that direction. And, um, yeah. but it's good for us because I, I think people never before have wanted an escape than they do now, other than maybe the great depression and who was created in the great depression, Batman and Superman and wonder woman. <laughs> so, good, man. so it's, you can use this to your advantage as a creator, uh, to build something. And I think that's what we're doing. You know, mm. with comics gate, definitely, absolutely, man. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, actually, this is a, a little bit related. So, you, you guys probably all know, have uh, heard about the uh, the recent controversy with one of uh, J. Scott Campbell's pieces of artwork. Yes, yes. I, I, saw a, yeah. I saw a tweet today 
um, and this this person says, uh, "Sure, I absorbed a lot of a, a ton of toxic, oversexualized comic book imagery as a young fan growing up in the '90s. I took those expectations into my early relationships and cut myself off from people who I could have loved and could love me. Not healthy behavior." Oh, and I say to that, uh, if you're basing your expectations of what you want in a relationship on a comic book or cartoon, <laughs> like, like you, you've got some character, other issues man. going on. Yeah, right? seriously. Like, like people can make, uh, like most people can make that distinction between a video game and reality, between a movie and reality, between a comic book and reality. So if right. you're like mm. looking at J. Scott Campbell's work and you're looking at your girlfriend and wondering why she's not more like a J. J. Scott Campbell drawing, man, like. <laughs> That's, we all like want our girlfriends to be James Scott. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's this cool movie. Uh, it's literally called Cool World. Uh, oh yeah, artist Ralph who, Bakshi, who, who draws a, a sexy lady, and uh -huh. um, he, she either comes alive or he gets drawn into her world. I think both things happen, in fact, in that movie. But I was just watching that. I'm like, yeah, this is my kind of movie. Yeah, it, it was gonna. It was actually gonna be a horror movie originally. He was going to have sex with her, and they were gonna pr produce like this abomination, half <laughs> half animated, <laughs> half real person that was gonna like That's take cool. over the world. Yeah, it was. It was actually Bakshi's concept for original concept was way cooler, but That's the a, studio, studio got scared of it, and so they yeah. they backpedaled out of it, and he wasn't yeah. able to get to make the movie he actually wanted to make. But there's some cool things in it. I mean, Kim Basinger is not bad looking at all. So yeah, and Hollywood. I mean, her design, the design of Hollywood, the the character. She's she's probably number two after Jessica Rabbit for most she sexy, great, man. yeah, most sexy cartoon character. Absolutely. Yeah, like, uh, so what I mean, uh, though. Oh. so what what's that, Corey? I was saying that's what I mean, man. Like I don't want to be reading reality. Like I don't want to read a book with someone on their phone or eating food or talking oh, yeah. about I hate food phones and, comic books. and you know i don't like i want the characters look like idealize like yeah they right. look like full-on fit i don't want to see a regular dude like, either by the way i don't want to see a regular woman or a regular dude yeah i, I, I want to read about a comic dude. about clayton man the guy's like <laughs> half bald and shit losing his hair i'm like fuck this book <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's why, like, history can be cool because it, I think what you're saying is it's not that you don't want real people. You just don't want real people in 2021. That's really what you don't yeah. want. Because yeah. today's, it's not, a, it's not a very interesting world. It, it just isn't. Um, no. The past, like, to me, is far more interesting than the present. You know, yeah. it's just... Yeah. Like, it did give you something to strive towards, even though it's probably impossible to be as cool as Wolverine. But it, it made you want to try to be cool, like Wolverine or something, right? Yeah, it's like totally. Standards. I might not be, I might not look like you, Jackman, but I can definitely wear Wolverine's jacket. I'm gonna try and track that down. You know, it's yeah, I, I do agree. Like to some extent, you're going to be influenced by the things that you engage with in in some small way, maybe maybe in a large manner or a small manner. But um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like that's that's called growth sometimes when you've got an ideal that you're working toward. That's actually a good thing, um, even mm. if you never meet it. But even sure, then, but like, you might look at Superman or Wonder Woman and you go, man, yeah, they're, they're physically amazing. Like no human being will ever attain that physically. But maybe you don't admire just that. Maybe by the fact that they're a hero, that they stand up for what's right. Maybe that's also what you're well, working but, toward remember you're not supposed yeah. to strive to be more you're supposed you're perfect the way you are so you're not supposed to be anything other mm. that that's the message mm. you're perfect exactly how you are even if you're it's 350 like pounds right, <laughs> right if you're 350 pounds it's okay you're beautiful you're perfect yeah you know, you'll be dead in a heart attack by 40 but you're perfect you know so yeah. and it's this whole notion of well you know that's good enough. Like uh, my students, you know, I push them to draw better and to be better artists because they're good. told their whole life, oh, it's beautiful. You're perfect. You're great the way you are. It's all oh, your imperfections. No, if you're drawing the hand wrong or the arm wrong, I need to tell you why. 
Now, if you want to deviate yeah. from it later, later you can, but when you're trying to do it correctly, you need to know how to do it correctly. And, um, yeah. you know, it's like a revelation. Sometimes the kids are like, Oh really? You're actually telling me I need to change something. Like I need yeah. to be better at something. And it's, be it's a strange feeling. You know? Yeah. 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 Exactly what it is. Yeah. It's funny. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, this, uh, this patting on the back for, for just being yourself, maybe you're an asshole and maybe you're, <laughs> you, you, are really healthy. Right. Maybe you are really unhealthy and you're at risk. And if, right. your friend, yeah. and if your friends, I say, Hey, don't worry about it. Like if society's saying, don't worry about it. You find the way you are, man, like they're not doing you any favors. They're probably sending you to an early grave. In fact. So, um, sometimes yeah. you need to hear the truth. And yeah. uh, like, they, they say, like, it's it's more respectful to respect people's feelings and shit. But that's bullshit. It's more respectful to tell them the actual truth so they change up some shit and don't get hurt. Okay, Corey, it's, I think it's you need like to tell if they the get fucked story. over. Corey, I think they you need get... to tell the saucepan story. <laughs> no, nah, man. Because <laughs> some of them watch it. But I'm just oh, really? saying, yeah. like, like they may they may hate you at the moment for actually telling them the truth. Like the truth is usually pretty hard to hear, right? Yeah, it is. Like, but I it's hate like it, but... they're gonna resent you more in future if you didn't tell them the truth, and then their whole life gets screwed up. Or it's, and do you want to really like, live in your you know, own hypnosis anyway? Like, imagine just walking around in this cloud of uh, self self grandeur, never really knowing what truly is. Yeah, uh, like, you need, you need, good, like, I, I love colors. getting, I love getting input from multiple places. Like, cause, cause here's the thing. I might be talking to a shit talker. Who's not telling me the truth. Who might just have some weird, maybe they want to see me fail. Right. So you got to get a number of different opinions and maybe you take some of them on board. Maybe you don't, but the important thing is, is you're widening, you're widening your understanding of a certain, uh, topic or certain subject and uh, mm. whether that be to do with you or what it is you create it's really important to, to get that feedback um because we we have the ability to take on feedback right so shouldn't we use that dude yeah, yeah, imagine if i got offended over you giving me advice on colors and i'm just like clayton fuck off man you're already you, good you're not you're not caring about <laughs> my feelings enough you need to say yeah. good okay well, I, I'm getting ready to do something really that's really going to probably be uh, rough is when I send out issues three, one through three, I'm actually sending a survey to my backers cool. and I'm going to yeah. have them rate my book before I'm even done with four, five, and six. So if I need to course correct, like if they say not enough action or not enough character mm -hmm. development or, you know, I think this is my favorite character. I want to see this character more. I'll be able to make, I'm not saying it'll have a like totally rewrite the whole thing but what i'm saying is it's an opportunity for me to gauge how it's being received while still finishing it so mm -hmm. it'll you know I, and i i don't know of many uh campaign creators that have done that you could do that you could release like book one and then then take the feedback into book two but in the middle of a series it, it's more like you, it's like they read half your graphic novel and then yeah. you get their feedback before you finish the other half, you know? So I don't know. I think it might be a good opportunity to, to get some, some honest and it's going to be anonymous. So I won't know who they are. <laughs> so, so they won't have to be nice. Like if they don't like something, they can be honest. Like, Oh, I didn't really care for this character or I didn't, I think you know, that's so smart. That's so smart of you to do that. Um, it's, it's going to give you far more than, uh, than, you know, any amount, you know, criticism, it always, it stings a little bit sometimes, but it gives you far more. Like if it's, it's, it's legit and you know, it's right. Sometimes it hurts the most yeah. when you know, you know, it's right. The truth. If we're telling you to reduce the uh, boobs, it's not legit feedback. Yeah. Don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that one. Yeah. If I get any SJW uh, recommendations, I'll be able to spot them pretty fast, but um, yeah, only native Americans are allowed to draw this book. <laughs> yeah, well, and they'll be like, she's so scantily clad. I'm like, um, have you done the research? Do you know how Algonquin women walked around? They were yeah. they were practically naked. I mean, they were completely topless, and they just wore a loincloth. 
That was it. Trying to cover them up. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I'm I'm being historically accurate here, and I actually I'm being trying to be kind of uh, modest about it. You know, I try to mm. cover her up as much as possible. You know, without it being like like ridiculously over the top or anything. But but you know, it is what it is. Thing. You covered her up too much. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll say that. I don't know. But because uh, even like when I did the action figure, I mean. I, Rather than just having her breasts completely out, she's wearing like a necklace with some feathers hanging down. So the feathers are hanging over it. It's like it makes it a little tasteful. So if you want to put it up on your shelf, you don't have to worry about your kid walking in the room and you know seeing a naked lady standing on your shelf. You know, so it's this is some good critique for you, man. You're gonna have to remove all your wealth now. You gotta take it all out. Yeah, see, see, it's already begun. <laughs> <laughs> it's already this started. This is too masculine for me. And yes, yes, there's. I'm getting. A, I'm getting a high you. level of testosterone. I mean, it is. He's getting ready to rip the wall down. This is an Arnold moment, if there ever was one. You know. Uh, or, yeah, <laughs> got to the chopper. <laughs> yeah, I can picture um, him making Arnold noises. And uh, they do talk. My shapeshifters do talk. They do still oh, have awesome. their their wits about them. It's not like the Hulk, where they they don't know who they are and they're just mm -hmm. tearing everything up. They can still speak. They still have their thoughts. They're still the person that they are. It's just whatever their subdued sort of desires are come out. So they become more violent, more intense, more extreme, you know. But yeah. it's still, they're still the person. Because I wanted them to be able to communicate and talk to each other in this form. I didn't want them just running around growling and grunting the whole time. I mean, so, that's it's really, about really as cool, masculine man. as you can get, like turning into the beast. So. Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. So, um, Nayla Malin says, uh, side note, Clayton, when are you putting out your book? I'm itching to back it. Um, I guess he's talking about uh, either Borok or Renegade Alpha. Um, so, Renegade Alpha, I'm not sure when that's coming, to be honest. The funny thing is the whole thing, has, it, all the layouts are done for it. Um, but when I started working on the layouts for Borok, uh, and seeing Julius's work on it, I got really, really inspired. And this world just started uh, growing itself. Like there was just this vast well of storytelling that I was able to tap into and characters were coming about. I was I was in some kind of crazy trance the first night yeah. I came up with, uh, with Borok and, and his backstory. And this world just quickly spread. Um, and so... Yeah, I'm. I'm like part of my, me wants to keep working on Borok, and uh, I was thinking while Julius actually illustrates the the first issue, uh, I'll illustrate the second one, and that way we can get two books out within the same series in, in maybe a year. That's that's one way of getting around that that I was uh, that I thought about. But uh, you know what? I'm gonna get because you asked Nayla Mailer, I'm gonna get a page up uh, from Borok, one of the newest ones, and uh, and just show you how it's looking because um i'm pumped man this is a, a beautiful looking book that's they uh said renegade alpha <laughs> uh renegade alpha yeah you know renegade alpha it's uh i, I don't i don't know man like it's funny because i was talking to leroy yesterday and he said that the concepts i came up with for renegade alpha the style i did them in that's his favorite style of mine and um and people seem to be waiting on Renegade Alpha. They seem pumped for it. So maybe I, I will just jump onto that. Um, I, I don't know, man. There's, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do, what I'm actually going to be illustrating after Kozor. So, yeah. Um, like, that's the thing about comics is, like, you always have ideas, but, like, it, like there's a massive amount of time you've got to put in to see it all through. It's like when you commit to one project, you got to commit to it and like just put all the other Absolutely. ideas out of the way. And it's hard. Yeah. And you're going to be on it for a while. Like the thing is, I I had the itch to do Renegade Alpha uh, only a few weeks ago when I was looking through some of that old Cyber Force and, and Mark Silvestri stuff. I was like, oh, it's cool. Uh, this is for Peter. He asked, is there a wear deer? Yes, there she is. <laughs> Beautiful. Look at her. She's gorgeous. Yeah, and that's that, Diana. That, so. Did you guys ever see the action figure? That thing sold out in two days. Oh, yeah. That figure all looks good. All ten of them. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, there she is. 
So see what I did was, I mean, she's got war paint on, but I put the feathers there to kind of give her a little bit of modesty. But uh, generally, when she's running around, it's just that's not covered. It's just Wait, her hair. Can you lift you up the feathers? Was that detachable? Yeah, it's it's all it's all this is all stitched. Like none of this is uh, the only thing that's sculpted or that's plastic is the the body, the hair. There's actual doll hair on her. These are all feathers. These things went for two hundred seventy five dollars a piece. That's amazing, man. Yeah, and um, and um, you know that they just it was a good call. It's one of those things where I was kind of taking a risk, but what um, you know, just of like getting the actual figure and stuff. It's it's about a hundred percent markup. Mm. Yeah, so they're not cheap, <laughs> you know, because they're custom made. I mean, they're hand, and that's not counting my time painting. So, um, but uh, and then I did the uh, the Warpath edition where she's in her Warpath. And I only did one of these. I'm only doing one. That's awesome. Uh, and this one went for That's seven fifty. Yeah, and she's twelve That's inches. Gorgeous, she's a man. she's a Barbie doll size action figure, and she's fully articulated. You can change the feet and the hands out. But um, you know, I had to. Uh, I couldn't do more than you know eleven of them because it's just it's so much work. I mean, all this stuff mm -hmm. has to be handmade, you know, and then yeah. packaged in the box and shipped. It's gonna. It's gonna be a massive amount of work just doing these eleven figures. I love um, that variation in the two figures. That's so cool. Yeah, this is her in issue zero uh, when she's uh, when she's younger because she doesn't have her tattoos yet on her. But see, I have to uh, on the actual Very figure. Realistic I, painting. On I have to paint the tattoos on her arms right here. You can't really see it, but there's like a tattoo running down her arm and, and across wow. the chest and everything on her. You know, and that all has to be painted for all ten of them. Yeah. It's going to take a while. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Yeah. But I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you're building your IP and she is my IP. I mean, because wherever the story goes, all the characters around her are going to be different because she's going to be different time periods. But she is the one consistent. She's the one constant throughout the whole, you know, all the different versions. And um, so it's going to be, I'm excited about it. It's, you know, I I don't know how you guys are, what your plans are with the uh, with with Kozor as far as like where you want to take it in the future. But I'm assuming mm. you want to build an IP out of it, like not just a one shot, but like build it into oh, something. Yeah. Well, that's why we that, got Borok and stuff going on, right? That's yeah. a because that's a spinoff, right? That's, that's a spinoff. That's a yeah. spinoff. Okay. Oh, I do want a Chief Baron statue though. Let me um let me get a page up of uh, Borok actually. So this is uh, one of the, the newest ones that Julius has handed in. So, you know, Chris and uh, yeah, Nail Malin, I know you guys are looking forward to Renegade Alpha. Hopefully this is also going to tickle your fancy as well. Um, so this is, uh, what is it, like page four? Zoom in here. Look at this. Got these goblins oh, here. Nice. They've they've just Beautiful. ransacked uh, the the king's uh, courier basically. You know they're taking all of his shit, and uh, Borok's been hired to take out this this gang of goblins that no one else, none of the other king's men have been able to deal with. So you know Borok, he he turns up, he's there on his giant hog. See, this doesn't need to be in color, <laughs> dude. I it know, looks right? so good in black and white, man. I don't know. I it's, just... We're offering a black and white version. Yeah. And I have I had half of mine, not the color. Yeah, at all. it doesn't. I mean, you can see everything clearly. All the, I mean, the values yeah. are all there. It's really cool. It's Julius is just freaking amazing. So I'm only going to show you the, the next page because I don't want to give all of this away. But um, this is a this is like a uh, like a nine page uh, prelude that's going to be at the start of the book just to introduce Borok. And then it gets into the main story, and it and continues on straight after uh, this situation. So Borok and the and this la lady here, uh, he manages to save her. By the way, just so you know, um, but they end up going on this this adventure for the rest of the book. Look at the quality that's being produced in Comics Gate right now. Yeah, I mean, because I know the other day John John Malin was saying, if we're going to say we're better than Marvel and DC, we better be better than Marvel and DC. Like we better be doing. Yeah as good or better than what they're producing that's as good or better than anything they're producing so totally, man. you that's know like it's, it's been a long time since i saw a comic book like yeah this, it, this and the weird this is a powerful 
artistic movement. I think it's more significant than Image was, to be honest with you. Because yeah. I think we're making better books. I mean, Image was great for its day because of what it was doing to the industry. But honestly, most of those books, when they were first coming out, weren't. <laughs> You know, they weren't the best stories. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Right. Like it, it was just the art. I mean, that, the art was the reason why everybody was buying those books. Let's be honest. But um, very true. This, I feel like comics. Yeah, I mean, I just read Monster MD, which is totally mm -hmm. stylistically different than anything you or I are doing, and it's a great book. Like it's yeah. a solid book. Like story, art, everything. It's it's as good as you can get. And and um, the stuff's. I can't wait for Groken. Um, yeah, man. That's I can't wait for for world. Fatal. I love Charlie Snogan's art. Can't wait that's for what Fatal. I mean, man. You can it's, walk into a comic book store and get that kind of stuff. That's the one you're going to go to. But the greatest artist in all of CG, I cannot wait, is Michael Bancroft. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I love we Michael. Don't, we don't like I just see him in the chat. So I, <laughs> no, I, I, told, I said on another chat, yeah. I said Michael Bancroft is the most underrated artist in CG right now. Oh, he man. does not get the credit. Yeah. He does not get the credit. The root hand, <laughs> the flat colors. Are you kidding me? He is underrated. I, I When I oh, went man. to do my, I, I was backing, I was going to back a bunch of books. I was going to back one book every week, and I did this for like four weeks, and I was going to pick four campaigns. The first one I picked was uh, The Lucent, and it's because the atmosphere in the book, like the, the way the, yeah. the way just it feels like you're in a movie i don't i can't explain it but i was looking at his art and i was just like man this is like it's cinematic in a, in its own way i don't know it just but it looks nothing like this it looks nothing like what i'm doing it looks nothing yeah. like monster md it looks nothing like fatal it looks nothing it's like really malin's work or ebs i feel like we have this broad range so it's just the atmosphere or is it like is it the fact that it's just like different no, Michael can establish. He knows. Food, yeah, he's good at keeping the mood and the lighting very consistent from panel to panel, and you feel like they're snapshots mm. in a live action movie. I don't. Know. It's like the Matrix he, or something. Yeah, like my colors doesn't color that way. As I showed you, I'll have panels that just explode into totally different colors that have nothing to do with the scene. Mm. Whereas I've noticed with, with with the Lucent, it's it's there's a flow. That feels like I said, like I can't explain it. Like you're watching a movie or something. I don't know, but um, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> well, I just I don't. People don't mention you enough, so I try to mention you more because yeah, um, dude, Michael's Michael's cool. Yeah, I I, I think that um, a lot of people talk about all oh, this artist and that artist, but I mean, Are you I me, I Are you kidding me? <laughs> I put, I I'll put his backgrounds up against anybody's. Yeah. Like we could talk all day long about you know figures and root root ginger root hands and all that stuff, but <laughs> like the backgrounds and the scenes that he builds, most artists would not put that work in. They'd just be like, ah, oh, just draw a building real quick and just oh, you know, and, and, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. So, I, I, yeah, go I ahead. Like I just show my show my new page that I call it, man. Yeah, we'll show that show in it. a second, Corey. We'll show that in a second. Uh, so we actually j only just got these these pages from Julius because. Um, at the moment, he, he's in the Philippines, and so they've been on lockdown over there. He had to, um, you know, get get his computer and stuff uh, in order, and so he's able to send these to me now. But uh, yeah, it's this is looking very, very beautiful. So let me show you the next page, right? Um, so Borok turns up, and then uh, what what happens next? Oh, I think this is the low res version. Hang on, let me get the high res version up. Oh, 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 oh. I'm going to move this over here. Don't want to give it all away. Um, ah, that should be a, a high-res version. Oh, no, no, it just went high-res. So the computer's catching up with it. Um, so Borat gets off of his uh, giant hog, right? And these these goblin dudes are like, hey. Like, oh, nice. He's like, they're like, you, you better get back on your hog, old man. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll tear you apart, basically. And then there's this, just this moment of silence. All the, all the dialogue's done. I, I'm writing this book and uh, and doing all the layouts for Julius. So he basically goes in there and reconstructs them, makes sure that everything is in order. But uh, 
you know, I can't write in any other way. I've got to do the layout. So there's this moment of just silence uh, where the, the goblins are, are waiting for Borok to have some kind of comeback. And then in this bottom panel, nice. it's just like the only dialogue here is just you're all dead. And uh, <laughs> while Corey knows what happens on the next few pages, I'm not going to show you guys, but uh, you, you see uh, Borok's true nature come out and, and just what he's capable of. And that's kind of the point of, of the prelude. Uh, it's it's I'm savage, telling you, man, man, black and white. I'm telling you, yeah. I know you want, I know color sells more, but I'm glad you're offering a black and white version. Oh yeah. That, yeah. that art, like when I read Savage Sword of Conan, I don't read it and go, man, I wish this was in color. Mm. I don't do no. that ever. And that, that would hold up in black and white. Oh, totally, man. But, like we, I knew that we, we had to do a black and white one too. And, and like I said, um, you know, some of the colors on this, they're going to be good, but the black and white is definitely going to be something which uh, I, I think if you get the color, you're definitely going to get the black and white anyway. So so I'm offering yeah. them both. And uh, I'd even like to get uh, Julius to do a special uh, unique black and white cover variant um, just to, to make a distinction between the two. I think that would be super cool. Um, but you see what I mean about like speed. That is oh, very yeah, time consuming rendering right there. It is, so man. You're gonna sa you you sacrifice output to get that, which is fine, but it's a slower process. Now I don't know how fast he is, but um Yeah. Or is that he, yours? He, is that, that that's that's not yours, right? No, that this yeah. is uh Julius's. So right, basically right. it I think it he can get this done in a week, but uh comfortably. Oof. I, I believe he's able to get he, – he gets it done in two weeks. Usually it's about wow. a week and a half. One um, page? Yeah, one page. Oh, my God. See, I try to get at least four of four, – three to four a week at least. Yeah, and to man. me, that's slow. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, I come from the world where you're supposed to get a page done a day. Like this at least pencil a week worth of work. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. See, that's what I mean. Is you, you find out how many hours he's working on it. Oh, what? Julius is working on the Kill Journal originally. That's amazing. I didn't know that, uh, Adam. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. he is a, a really amazing artist. I, the first time I saw Julius's work, it was in the How to Draw Comics group. And uh, I saw it, and I'm like, that's if I do a Borok book, that's the guy I want. I was or originally looking at Kanan White, actually, as well. So it was either Kanan or Julius. And... Um, you know, I hit up Canon, but we he we we didn't really it didn't really end up going anywhere. Uh, so I, I hit up Julius, and he was really happy to to get involved with it. And then when I saw him uh, draw up those first few pages, I'm like, oh my goodness, yeah, never leave me. Like this is <laughs> like no one else can do Borok. Like you're the one. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, we were hey, very happy to find him. Can share my colors and? Fear into uh, Bancroft, man. Yeah, I can't, Cor yeah. Corey, Corey didn't like all of that that okay. Bancroft ego stroking that I just did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Uh, I know none of you are a fan of the the Borok stuff, so I, I'm looking forward to showing you guys more Borok. I'm not sure how long in, in the making it's going to be. It's probably going to be a year, maybe more. Um, but that's why I want to kind of get started on another Borok book so that we can you know, get these things coming out a bit more regularly as well. So um, good stuff takes time. And here's the colors Corey has been yeah. working on for Coz or Descent yeah, into Madness. This is still a work in progress, though. I love those eyes on that beast. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let See, me, it's cinematic. Um, cinematic. It's very cinematic, Corey. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Let, let me these, get up. Um, these are actual finished ones. I'll get up some pages, uh, that, some completed pages that Corey has done up, actually, uh, for Kozor recently. So we're, we're going back and we're actually recoloring some of the pages to fit the mood of the story a bit better. So, uh, okay, here's one. And I, I just feel like, man, this is hitting nail on the head with the, the Kozo vibe that we want to go with. So, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. I love the yeah, yellow it, tones on her flesh. That's yeah. You do a lot of cuts. I like that. I'm a fan of the cuts method 
uh, I don't like colorists that use too much airbrush and they don't use those cuts. You need yeah. those nice, uh, those nice sharp edges on the highlights, yeah. like on her chin, right there. Yeah, that's nice. It, it builds it up. Into so the, uh, yeah. Cuts. So, the fear yeah. of Bancroft. I know he's sitting there in his chair. He's he's panicking. <laughs> Roy and Bancroft are always feuding. Um, here's uh, here's in the next page after. So we'll show you another page here. But um, I, I was just so like Corey's coloring game has really upgraded to the point where I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's dude, very like, it's very rich. Um, mm. Your coloring is like eating a a banana split. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's 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 full of flavor and it's like a really heavily seasoned steak uh, yeah. it's, it's which i mean it being that this is a barbarian book and it's all about you know there's lust and violence and just like mm. living for the moment kind of I don't know, it it no yeah. it's like a it, you know it, it works yeah yeah it's Did I? yeah bancroft i know you're lying about that man you're not chuckling <laughs> right now uh chuckling maniacally yeah. Everyone's always coming at Bancroft. If, if it's not you, it's it's Rob. I just yeah. can't stand uh, it. The yeah, no, I, I told I told I told both of them they better watch their back because I'm I'm in the rearview mirror right now. Oh yeah, I, I'm I am closing in. I'm closing in on thirty six, and they're only four thousand five thousand ahead of me. So um, I've already passed your backer numbers. <laughs> ooh, <laughs> oh, ooh, you, but they know that. Quiet, right there. <laughs> But no, I mean, I always say that the reason why my campaign succeeded is because the first thing I did was listen to Rob Arnold. So oh, it's, yeah. his, it's his fault. He's the one that made the little manual to help guys like me, uh, you know. Yeah, he's created. Yeah, he created you. Move ahead. A month now, so. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> What's he going to do? Um, all right, so I'll show you one more thing. This is a the one of the latest pages we finished off for Coes or as far as the, as far as the inks go. And I'm going to show you... Um, why it can sometimes take like a week to do a page, even though we have the best intentions to do a page every uh, like two days, two, three days. Uh, sometimes uh, you create a page like this. It's an important page. It's Borok. I mean, no, sorry, Chief yeah. Baron and his get up for the first time. Uh, and you've just, you, you've got to make a splash with it, you know? So it's Corey, beautiful. I can't wait for you to color this up, man. Yeah, man. Um, Sure. It's I mean you you could try hiring Bancroft for it, man. I mean <laughs> if you want it really it, yeah. if you want it super cinematic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Corey's never gonna forget that. <laughs> that <Yeah>. I said that. <laughs> no. No. Um That's yeah, weird. this is this really pushed me to the limit. I love how with uh with every page we're doing, it, it feels awesome. like we're we're breaking beyond our our boundary. And, and we're just taking it up a level. So, uh, yeah, this page came out great. Uh, I'm yeah, going to post an happy. update uh, later on, probably today. We've got to put out another update. Uh, we were going to put the original weekly. alongside it, man. Uh, what's that, Corey? Don't put the original alongside it. No, it's okay. I'll what's wait. the original? <laughs> uh, look, the That's original was still cool, man. Like Corey's uh, original version of the book, it had some charm, and I, I think people are really going to be able to uh, appreciate it as well when they, if they have backed that mm. that fifth tier, uh, where you get you get all the books, you get the original version, you get the remastered, and all the variant covers are black and white. But uh, yeah, Corey's version, um, uh, it's got some charm to it, man, and it is going to be fairly different. Uh, but there's going to be a pretty big difference between the two. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Like the definitely. new version with those colors will definitely have a much more gritty. It's beautiful. Realistic style. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. I'll be, um, I'll be right back guys. Yeah. Corey, you hold the floor for us. All right. Okay. Since I'm in control of the thought of the fort, <laughs> Bancroft's colors are flat and no one can change my mind about it. No one can. Less is more, my friend. Less can be more. You've heard I that guess, before. I mean, it, it, it's not the worst comic I've seen. It is pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean getting like honestly, it looks better than most Marvel and DC books. I think. 
most of the new ones. I, I th yeah, I mean, I think the mainstream is, you know, I, they're really not, there's not much to see, you know, nothing to see here, right? I mean, yeah. the last thing I bought that was any good, and it was really mainly just the art, was uh, Three Jokers, Jason Favik's art, and that oh, was yeah. just awesome. But, I mean, the story was, eh, I mean, there were some, you know, I, I was a little disappointed in the story, to be honest. I, I thought it could have been, it, it wasn't what I was expecting. I thought it was going to be a little stronger. But, um, yeah. Like, yeah, it kind no. of makes me sad, man, because I did use for like the uh, David Finch Batman comics and stuff, right? Like, yeah, I, I, I used to like DC, but it's yeah. like when I go to a bookstore and I see them on the shelf, I'm like, should I even bother looking? Uh, I'd just be disappointed. Yeah, <laughs> I just go over to the manga section. I mean, maybe, maybe the stories that needed to be told have been told, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe it's time for new stuff you know i mean i don't know i'm not saying batman doesn't have more i mean he's a great character but how many more times can we keep flogging these same characters over and over again before we just go is is it time for something new you know yeah, absolutely i mean what's really been created in the last 50 years that's memorable i mean not a lot you know not a whole lot yeah that's true that's true like Another thing that really bothers me is when they cheapen out. So my flats, whole flat color thing that really, it, it probably came more from this one, like David Finch comic I seen where it's like, it was just basically flats put on his artwork. And I'm like, damn, like this colorist didn't even give a fuck. There's more flat on Bancroft's. <laughs> like, well, you know, when you I'm think like, about it, classic comic book it. coloring from the eighties was just flats. When you think of yeah. it that way, it's kind of weird. Like it, like that's understandable because they didn't have that technology. But it's right like now, like you can actually go through the effort of making something truly epic. But, right. You know. Oh yeah. Well yeah. It's it's um. I mean, digital coloring's definitely been the biggest change in comic and and print quality. And not only that, yeah. but the cost. It used to cost so much more to do a comic book than it does now. I'm I'm shocked. At how affordable it is now to, to print yeah. a book and it, oh, they used yeah. to printers printers used to not print books for less than five three to five thousand copies they wouldn't do less than that you couldn't you couldn't find anybody who would do it um and now with with printers online you can i mean you could do 250 copies if you wanted to of a book you know and That's so cool so yeah. i love it all right we got zade comics in the house hey what's hey. up phil what up? Yeah, so, you know, getting back to detail, because what you just showed me was highly detailed. So when you go back to looking at this, you see it's not that detailed. But um, I'm able, that's, you know, hmm. I, I try to find a balance between detail and, and efficiency. <laughs> you know, like hmm. getting it done, right? Because, um, you know, in this age of amazing color, I don't need to throw a lot in there you know um and of course yeah. michael gold michael golden's one of my favorite artists so I, I take a lot of my leads from from him and his rendering but um you know i don't know i just feel like um you know if i were to do any more than what you see here yeah. um i think it would yeah. become cluttered you know what i mean it like, looks good too man like this is a point we actually do need to get to as well um, is is we need to somehow in order to speed up. I mean, four pages a week for for you, Murph. That's well, insane. If I if I don't, it won't it won't come out. It'll take years yeah. to finish the book. Mm. Like people will be waiting till twenty twenty three. So I have yeah. to make this. Like you saw how fast I inked that this right here yeah. as we were talking. Oh yeah. But there really isn't that there isn't that much detail there when you look at it. It's just I mean it's very rudimentary. Right, I put the darks where I feel like they needed to be. There's contrast, and then I rely on my colorist to go in there and really mm. make it make it sing, you know. Yeah. So that's like, so cool. But what I think I'm like, you know, in the comics and comics gate gives people like such opportunities to do something like really special. Like Malin said, if you do a page at least one a week, fifty six page book. And I know Clayton's can keep to about a week for like epic yep. pages. And I'm like, why wouldn't you do a special book like that? 
if you're Clayton. Yeah. You know? Uh, and yeah, yeah, when I when I heard Malin say when I heard Malin say a page a week, I couldn't believe it. I was like, a page a week? <laughs> like you'll never get the book done. <laughs> yeah. But then he's like, but he's talking about a fifty-page book. So yeah. you keep in mind, yeah. my six issues is a hundred and fifty pages long. That's so, the year and then the and then I've got to do issue zero, which is another thirty-two pages, right? And then I did the handbook, which took me a, a month. Um, so that you're not going to get that done a page a week. It's not going to happen. I mean, people are waiting forever. So it just depends on what your goals are. It is a balance and it depends on what your goals are. See, I want more story. So I have to make a decision. How far am I going to go? How much time am I going to spend before I move on? You know, and, uh, you know, it, I, I feel like I've found the right balance for, for the type of work I'm doing because like I said, you know, when I showed you what he did, um, you know, the. You are working just, immensely fast, too. I can't believe it. See, I don't think yeah. I'm fast. <laughs> I, Jack Kirby was fast. But I mean, you know, there's yeah. you don't need any more detail in this when you have a colorist doing That's this. Great, it, 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 and this took yeah. forever. I mean, this took days to do. This took about almost a week to, to do. Uh, to color up. No, to draw, oh, to draw, to draw. Yeah, but I mean, my point is, I spent this was a double page spread, so I spent mm. the same time on a double page spread that some people are spending on one page. So yeah. that, would, that, that would that would take my productivity down so low that I'm I'm just not able to tell the stories I want to tell. Yeah, and and I want to get these stories out and delivered. Mm. And like um, it, it looks pretty detailed though, like a canon one, and it's really I not though. <laughs> I mean, it is and it isn't. <laughs> It is and it it's isn't, illusion, and man. it is an illusion. And because it's funny, because like I'll think it's detailed, and then you'll show me something like what you just showed me, and I go, well, "That's detailed." <laughs> like <laughs> that's just, you know. So you, you, it's funny how you know it's all relative, like in a weird way. Like you, just when you think it's like with an animate when you're an animator, you think you're exaggerating, like when you exaggerate a squash and stretch, like when a character jumps or something, and then you play it back, and it doesn't look exaggerated. And you're like, why did I, and you got to take it even further and take it even further just to get it to, you know, to do what it's supposed to do. Um, animation is that way very similar. I, um, I do wonder, you know, whether or not, like Corey, considering the detail he has in his work is quite fast, man. Like I've seen you knock out a page, a fully inked page in like two hmm. days with full detail like you're pretty like, damn it quick it depends on the amount of stuff in the panels as well like when there's mm. a lot of characters it's always going to take time so yeah true so murph how long on average would you say it takes you to do a page like a like a day or two uh usually yeah but i mean like it depends like you just what you just said is is key figures the reason why issues four five and six are going to take me so much longer and why i'm shipping one through three without four five and six is because there's battle scenes in four, five, and six. So it's like, you know, even if you just want to draw ten soldiers or fifteen soldiers in a panel, mm. it takes forever. You know, like, well, like what I, you know, like that cover I keep bringing up. Just putting all these guys in this clump right here, mm. just spacing mm. them out and figuring out where they're supposed to go, you know, and. You know, they're all carrying weapons. They all have uniforms on. They all have, you know, haversacks, and there's straps on the guns. There's bayonets. They've got their wigs on, their hats. I mean, that, that stuff takes forever to draw. That's yeah. why some artists don't like doing historical because they don't like drawing, you know, five, you know, soldiers, ten soldiers in every panel, every every page. Yeah. You know, it gets old. But see, I love history. I like drawing the uniforms and the guns and the stuff. So to me, it's it's fun, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, you just add a couple figures uh, in there, you know, or just trying to figure out the movement, like just this chain. I don't envy Todd McFarlane with Spawn and with Spider-Man because no just drawing this chain, these links, every one of these links, I mean, it took forever, mm -hmm. you know, because you're going, you're going link by link by link by link by link, you know. It's a good looking and, chain, though. Yeah, yeah and you could use a brush, but it's never going to look the same. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I will say, digital color or digital inking makes all the difference in the world. I would not be okay. nearly as fast if I was doing this traditional. It'd totally. take way longer, and then you got scanning. 
time where you got to scan all the pages, which is a pain. Mm -hmm. I love digital. I, I don't know why everybody doesn't do it. I mean, I know why they want original art to sell, but mm -hmm. if you want to be efficient and fast, I mean, I don't know how you can beat digital. I really don't because it's just, it's, it's lightning fast, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, Lord Crackhead says, I got to say, getting to know Murph and War Party a bit better over the last few months has quickly made it one of my most anticipated projects. Murph's killing it. Thanks, sure. Crackhead. Thank you, Crackhead. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. And, man, let me tell you, uh, I didn't even have a Twitter account when I launched my campaign. I didn't know, any, I didn't know anybody in Comicsgate. I didn't know any – I had never been on a stream. I didn't know you. I didn't know – Bancroft, I didn't know Rob, I didn't know uh, Patrick Thomas Parnell, I didn't know any of these people. Yeah. I was totally on the peripheral, um, and I, I, I think I'm an example of what you can do in Comicsgate, not having a big platform at all, mm. and uh, not even doing things necessarily the right way, <laughs> you know, because I didn't, you know, I didn't spend three months promoting my book and getting sign up people signed up to the email list. I, you know, I didn't do any of that. Um, I just came into the picture with something I believed in and putting a lot of work in it. But my campaign wasn't even at $15,000 when it closed after 60 days, I wasn't even at 15,000. I'm at 36. Wow. Now I made over $20,000 in demand. That's yeah. amazing. That doesn't happen, right? So, <laughs> I mean, even Rob told me, he goes, that doesn't happen. I said, I know. I don't, I don't know. So it, it was one of those things where I think word of mouth had to get out. I had to get – I just had to get out there, you know, and people had to sort of get to know me and the project a little bit more. Um, but I don't know. I just I – just, I think – CG is interesting because they're they're very clear on what they want. You know, yeah. when I say they, I mean I know, I'm not just saying everybody likes the same stuff, but I it's very you can usually tell the books that are succeeding, and you and you can see why they're succeeding. Like you yeah. know, it, it, it becomes a little obvious what CGers like. I think just as an audience, what they prefer. It's um, worth studying too. It's like a good little, um, uh, what would you call it, focus group, the Indiegogo in general, because you can see what campaigns people are into, and and maybe those numbers are skewed sometimes. But well, yeah, I mean, I, you have to take into account people's platforms do make a difference, obviously. So mm, if you have, you know, if you have a hundred thousand people on watching your channel, naturally, you launch a book, it's going to be somewhat successful no matter what you do. So that is going to happen, but hmm. but I'm 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 an example of somebody who didn't have a platform and honestly still doesn't. I mean, I have a channel, but it doesn't get a lot of views. Yeah. So you don't really a platform's important, but just make a good product, and I think people will find you. Like they, they just get out there, they will, you know, they'll they'll support you and. Um, yeah. it, Michael says, um, Murph's case is a perfect example of the power of promotion. Fans are willing to back great projects, but they need to know those projects exist. It's very, very true. And I think one of the coolest things about Murph is that when he's on a stream like this, you can actually see him working on the book you've backed. That's kind of really, like, you can't get better than that. I feel like, you know, yeah. it's like, like, like the proof in the pudding, man. This guy's actually producing the book that I've invested money into. And, um, you know, it's the, it's the proof. The proof is right there in front of you. This is your book being created. It's amazing that you can actually see it getting created. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I don't, I mean, I know some artists don't like to draw on streams. I've heard, had several artists say that They're like, I just, I'm not comfortable. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's fun. I love it. I think um, I prefer yeah. coloring on stream over drawing. Yeah, I know, well, I know you do, comes. but your, your head's always down. <laughs> you need a screen cap. You need to put a camera. Are you drawing digitally? You're drawing digitally. Yeah, yeah. digitally. Yeah, so you should probably do. You should probably screen share more. I'd like to see more of it. I know yeah. you do sometimes, mm -hmm. but um, but like uh, I know um, well I know Michael says he doesn't like to do it. 
Um, yeah. I know Ethan's been I doing it more. Why he wouldn't like it? <laughs> Ethan's <laughs> been doing it more lately, but I know Ethan has said he he generally prefers not to because I think it slows him down. He says it it's hard for him to talk and draw at the same time. Mm -hmm. he, he, um, mm. But I have noticed he's been doing it more. Um, yeah, I I gotta say I, I gotta go back. I get it. Clayton's not going to be happy, but I got to work in colors. So. Yeah, I'll dude. Well, we, we're going to we'll, we'll go now anyway, man. It's all good. I was only go usually we try to keep these to two hours, but you know, Murph was uh, on such a roll. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have fun. Yeah, man. It was great. We'll uh, we'll definitely do this again if you're up for it. Um, yeah. Because... Whenever you whenever you want, I'm going to be doing this for the next six months. <laughs> That's what's great about you, man. Like you're so comfortable drawing on stream and. Uh, Heck what yeah. better place to do it than how to draw comics, right? Definitely. Yeah. Anytime you guys want me on, I'll come back. And we'll we'll hang out. We'll Visual. continue our we'll continue our conversations. As far as I hope I hope people got some information. I know we deviated from the subject a yeah, little, but good. This, you yeah. know, right. so yeah, that's okay. We'll, we'll come up with more subjects too. But I I liked our conversations today. I thought they were really interesting. It was. Probably more related with storytelling, I would say. But uh, yeah, we can we can talk more into that next time as well. So uh, everyone in the chat who's been hanging out with us for like, <laughs> there we go. Check it out, guys. There it is. There it is. Uh, look, actually, let's get the campaign up here. Damn, I can't believe we haven't got the campaign up. Um, so check uh, out War Party, everybody. Uh, we got a link to it in the description below. Um, it's oh, it's shit. a really beautiful kick-ass looking book. You can see some of the pieces here in the campaign that uh, Murph showcased today. Some of the stuff that he's been working on. Uh, this is really really cool. Like I know that you knocked this out really fast, but this isn't the most simplistic uh, comic book art that I've ever seen. This is actually quite complex and intricate. So the fact yeah. that you're able to do it in a day or so. Uh, is just it, it blows my mind. Like you don't you don't always see comic books that look this good that are done in that amount of time. So, well, thanks. Um, yeah, beautiful colors, of course. Great looking line work. Interesting characters. Uh, unique story, uh, as well. So, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I backed it, of course. Like it, it's hard to resist Murph for too long. Like. <laughs> He, because once you subscribe <laughs> to his campaign, you'll start getting new offers, and and they'll, they'll seem small, but before you know it, you've added every single add-on that he's offered. And it's like, <laughs> how did I end uh, up with this giant? That's like, why. Uh, that's why I have eight hundred fifty-eight backers, guys. <laughs> there you go. It's just but uh, I, I, I'm determined. I want to hit a thousand at this point. I'm like, I see a thousand within reach, and I don't oh, want to yeah. close the campaign till I hit that's a thousand. What the, Let's look, watch the trailer real quick. Um, okay, yeah. Corey, don't worry. Don't worry, man. We're just going to watch no, the trailer. It's okay, man. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Everything changed when war reached the Americas. Caught between the French and the British. The family paid the price. Only my darling Sarah survived. I took her away. We couldn't save them, but we will save her. Five men against thousands, how can it be done? We are not really men. War has brought out the beast in us all. And we will have our vengeance, for we are... The War Party. That was a fantastic trailer. Oh, thanks. Yeah, really? I did the animation too, the wolf. That took a while. <laughs> I did yeah. that thing two years ago, that wolf animation. That's how long I've been planning this campaign. Just, you know, because I've been watching Comicsgate for over almost three years now, probably since oh, nice. the, Doug Tenaple and, you know, that whole crew was still on the yeah. <laughs> channel. We're going way back, you know. Oh, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah so. Uh, 
Yeah, we so came I was, after that actually. Yeah, I know you guys did, I, but I've been I wasn't in it, but I was like watching and you know sort of observing everything that was happening long yeah. before. So. <laughs> what? <laughs> I swear, if you play the Kozar trailer, I'm out of here. I, Rob, why are you still here? I thought you, you haven't you warned to leave like three times already. <laughs> no, Corey goes. Corey said to me the other day, and he's gonna hate me for saying this. Too. He's like, "Man, don't call me out on stream for like leaving." And I'm like, um, <laughs> "Yeah, dude, well, it goes dude, past I, two hours." And I'm like, <laughs> "We agreed to one hour for the stream." Right. He's got to get his work done. I get it. You know? yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, the difference is, see, I can stay here like, all night. Because I'm working. Up for someone's on stream, it's like it makes me look like the worst K ever. Like Adam no, Post no. was on before, and I feel like, you know. Corey, <laughs> you know, we all get memes made out of us, okay? Everybody knows that I'm not quite sure about my feelings when it comes to octopi or tentacles. I don't know. I don't know how I feel, right? Everybody knows this. And you're, you've got your own memes too. Uh, your meme is that y you're always ending the stream when everybody's having a ton of fun and uh, and that you also have long, an man. ambient riddled studio. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. It's, it, was, it, it's, it was the Bancroft uh, atmosphere quote. I never should have said that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I apologize, Corey. Yeah. Right. You should do. Now Corey's like, man, I'm out of here. Screw these guys. I told you, Bancroft's meal is like, you know, like when you go to like get some really nice sushi. Your meal is like a heavily seasoned steak. I like yeah. them both. I like them both, but they this taste completely a bit different. more bland. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, by the way, everybody, uh, be sure to check out the Lucent, actually. We've got to drop a link below. We normally do. Yeah. Um, but fellow Aussie comic book creator, uh, even though we're feuding, uh, we, we actually love the guy. Yeah, he's a cool dude, guy. I, I, actually, I hope I hope Lucen does well because he's a, a fellow Aussie. I just don't yeah. I, I don't agree with the colors. That's all. <laughs> Check out the Replicator, uh, Replicator Three. Uh, really, a, another kick-ass Aussie book as well. Um, Great colors, you know, the Aussies. Aussie. Yeah, they're, they're coming up there. You know, Murph might be leading, leading uh, so far, but. Uh, we're not far behind. Well, Rob's leading in dollars. He is. Or dollar a dues. Dollar a dues. Yeah. Damn but, that replicator. Um, I got him beat in the backer count, the backer category, and that's driving him crazy, I know. Mm -hmm. totally. Oh, it sends him mad. <laughs> um, I don't know why he should claim me. I Like I said, I'm, I'm from the Rob Arnold school. Yeah. So he should be, he should be claiming me. The student should one of, the master. Yes. As one of his uh, proteges. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. He just taught you well. He was too good at what he was doing. <laughs> um, all right. So, everyone in the chat, thanks so much for tuning in today. Really appreciate you as always. Absolute pleasure. Um, and, yeah, we'll have more streams coming up next week. We're going to take the, the weekend off of streaming. Um, but uh, but we'll be but back. You're old, more. please. Mm -hmm. More kick-ass artists, and I know I have more gray. I have more gray than you, Rob. Hey, uh, you, you've never seen movies where like the sergeant is older than the lieutenant. Come on, how many <laughs> World War II movies is the the grisly old sergeant who takes orders from the younger lieutenant? Right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a really good point. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that's even. Is he trying to? Throw an insult there or, or a compliment. That's just Robin's his thing. Nice. Like I met Rob in real life. He looks older in real life than on camera, I think. He saw my gray hairs in a photo and he's never let me live it down. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I keep telling him the only people in comics gate older than me are like Adam Post, Art T. Bear, and Billy Tucci. That's about it. <laughs> oh, and, and the top of Clayton's head. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely in the that. senior community of the. Um, I'm even older than Ethan, so I'm in the senior community of uh, Comics Gate. We should be listening yeah. to you guys, <laughs> and taking some pages out of your book. Um, um, all right, all right, Corey, get to work. Go make me that steak, Corey. Heavily seasoned. <laughs> I'm gonna make Thanks sure. For, it's well uh, Absolute pleasure as always, and until next time, everyone, take care. We'll see you in the next stream. Bye bye. <laughs>